program in the Delta Good. Um, in the Delta section, I'm a co-chair for the today's water quality and phytoplankton session with um, my co-chair, um, Keith Bauma Gregson. So thank you all for being here. Our first speaker is um, Tiffany Brown. She's an environmental scientist at the Department of Water Resources in their Division of Integrated Science. She is the lead for the phytoplankton component of the Environmental Monitoring Program. And it's a fabulous data set. I've used it where it's been published. So thank you, Tiffany. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. Today, I'm going to talk to you about a study we did uh, uh, via 2018-2019 looking at uh, phytoplankton samples collected at different depths. So a little bit of background about our program. The Discrete Environmental Monitoring Program has been sampling in the Delta since 1975. We collect simultaneously water quality, phytoplankton, and zooplankton samples. And then we have a separate uh, sampling run for benthic invertebrates. Our sampling frequency is approximately monthly. We sample using our research vessel, the Sentinel here, and we have two shore base stations that we sample via car because they're inaccessible by boat. So a lot has been in the news a lot lately, harmful algal blooms, they're increasing in frequency and toxicity and things like that. Even if they're not toxin producers, they can still foul waterways and cause water quality problems such as taste and odor problems. In freshwater, cyanobacteria are the, usually the main culprits. Microcystis is uh, in these pictures here with the, the floating stuff. And then you see a filamentous uh, delicospermum at that time as anabina, it's been, since been changed. Both of these can cause uh, toxic blooms. Microcystis is the first documented in the estuary in 1999. It's definitely the one that gets the most attention, though it's not the only one that can cause problems. And it really does form nuisance blooms and surface gums worldwide where it's been found. So it brings us to our study background because a lot of these HABs tend to occur at the surface, but our phytoplankton samples are taken from one meter depth. And the reason why is so that we actually avoid oversampling, you know, large scums and blooms and things like that. But that means our standard phytoplankton sampling methods, they could be missing microcystis and other HABs that tend to aggregate at the surface. Microcystis has the ability to produce gas vesicles that helps it to float at the surface to take advantage of better light conditions. So our study questions are, are there any differences in the overall phytoplankton community between a one meter depth sample and a sample taken at the surface, a whole water sample? Are there differences in the overall phytoplankton biovolume between samples at a meter depth and our surface samples? And if these communities or biovolumes are different, what are the taxa that are responsible for those differences? So here's our study methods. We wanted to compare our community composition from these two different sample uh, types at one meter depth and surface samples. We compared natural unit counts per milliliter and biovolume per milliliter at the genus species level and at the overall phytoplankton group level. When I see a phytoplankton group, I mean a broad generic category such as centric diatom, cyanobacterium, chrysophyte, things like that. We collected samples at all of our stations from July 2018 through July 2019 using the flow through system on the Sentinel for one meter depth samples and a Van Dorn for the surface samples. If you're not familiar with a Van Dorn, there's a picture of it here in the corner. It's a cylindrical tube that you submerse into the water, pull a little lever and those little plungers will close, those blue plungers will close and collect a whole water sample for you. At our shore base stations, we also have a flow through system that we use for the one meter depth samples. Our samples are asked, analyzed for taxonomy and biovolume by our contractor, BSA Environmental Inc. So let's get into natural unit versus biovolume. What is the difference? Well, natural unit is how it occurs in nature. This is how they would normally grow and things like that. It can be individual cells. It can be cells clustered in colonies or filaments. And natural units are preferred for sample counts because this is how non-phytoplankton will encounter them. So if a copepod is looking to eat something and it encounters a large filament, maybe it's a little more difficult for it to eat that than, say, an individual cell. So those natural units really tell us a lot about how the organisms occur in nature. Biovolume is cell contents. It can be used as a proxy for biomass. Now this has to be measured on individual cells and not natural units because for natural units like colonies and filaments, you can have broken cells. Some colonies uh, grow in mucilage, which doesn't really have any biomass contents. You don't wanna measure that mucilage. Biovolume can be extrapolated out for natural units with more than one cell. So you get a total biovolume per mil. And to give you some examples of the kinds of variation in sizes, Here's some examples. We have very tiny cells like Synecococcus, very large cells like Coconeus. You can have a wide range of varying biovolumes. There's different types of colonies here, and you see the different types of filaments and planktolingvia. 
Here's a map of our sampling stations. We sample as far north as Hood on the Sacramento River and as far south as Vernalis on the San Joaquin, east to the port of Stockton and west out to San Pablo Bay and then up into parts of Grizzly Bay, Sassoon Bay and Sassoon Marsh. Our data analyses were performed in the primer software package using analysis, analysis of salinities or ANASIM to check if these phytoplankton communities are in these uh, one meter depth and surface water samples are different. And we use non-metric multi-dimensional scaling for data visualization. This is a nice non-parametric routine that is robust to data that is not normally distributed. It basically takes two samples and compares them. If they have more species in common, they'll cluster out together closer on the, uh, on the graph. It doesn't, the NDS does not really have any units either. So NSM is a non-parametric test that produces an R statistic. It's scaled between zero and one. Zero means there's no difference between the samples. Our null hypothesis is true. One is there's complete separation. Our alternative hypothesis is true. And because this is a non-parametric test, it uses permutations to calculate a p-value. Now, permutations are great for non-parametric tests like this, but it means they're always going to be driven by the sample size. We have a lot of samples, so we tend to have pretty low p-values, but this is where the value of R itself as a statistic comes in handy to determine how to interpret your results. R should really be greater than 0.3 for any sort of statistical significance, regardless of how low your p-value is. So now let's get into some results. We have, these are the types of phytoplankton we saw, about nine groups overall, various flagellates, diatoms, cyanobacteria, a couple ciliates, uh, total unique ta taxa that could be identified to the genus or species level was 106. So we got a pretty diverse community here. And this was in both the one meter and the surface samples all together. This is all that we saw. And now getting into the anosim results, there is no statistically significant difference between these samples, between one meter depth and the surface samples. If you look at these in the natural unit group comparison, at the group type, algal type, that's our centric diatom cyanobacteria, our R value is very low, despite our P value being very low. Keep in mind, R should be 0.3 or greater, and these Rs are pretty close to zero. At the genus exam, um, analysis as well, you can see that is there, the R value is extremely low. And our group biovolume, R is even lower, and genus biovolume, same. So the, and the NMDS plots are gonna show a lot of overlap between these types of samples. So you're gonna see that next. And if you can see here, natural units on the left and biovolume on the right. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> so um, uh, if you see this here, you can see the, the surface samples are the red triangles and the one meter depth are the blue circles. And you just see that there's a lot of overlap. There's no real separation here. Whatever is ex going on with this pattern, it's not explained by the sample type. These things just did not cluster out like we thought they were going to. But we could still look at something like microcystis. Maybe certain habitats so will show a different pattern overall with what's going on here. Maybe we'll see something different because we do know it likes to congregate at the surface. Spoiler alert. There's no difference here. We actually saw more of it in the meter depth samples than in the regular samples. And I think a lot of this has to do with 2019 with this being a very extremely wet year. That water year, 2018 to 2019, is like the third wettest period on record. Now that may change. 2023 is basically told all the other wet years, hold my tasty beverage and watch this. So we'll see what happens. But as far as this goes, with this study, we did not really see any difference between those different types of samples. We didn't see any microcystis really at the surface. In 2019, with the high outflows that we had, it just was not conditions for microcystis to develop. Another piece of data that we take is a visual microcystis score. This is what our field crew does, is they look at this and visually uh, one to four identify, is there a lot of microcystis, is there not? This is from 2016 through 2022. So if you look at 2018 and 2019, the index is one, meaning it's very low. There's no observable microcystis at the surface. So we just didn't have those conditions where we were seeing a lot of microcystis to begin with. And that's probably you know reflected in our results. 2019, wet year, not a lot of HABs, not a lot of microcystis in the water. So to sum up, this study showed no differences between the phytoplankton samples taken at the surface versus one meter depth in the general phytoplankton community. So we're not seeing, we're not missing that any sort of surface gums or blooms. That's good. But the results are probably affected by just the overall lack of microcystis and HABs and surface blooms that we saw in 2019. Again, very wet year. And especially since the majority of the microcystis was in the one meter depth samples, it wasn't conditions where it could aggregate and form those surface colonies that we see during large blooms. That's bad. If the study were to be done again during the presence of large microcystis, which you know occurs during dry years or drought years, it would help improve our understanding of how these different sample types you know, really affect the phytoplankton community. And that's something that definitely the water year type will have a, a different you know, context for the phytoplankton community. 
that's good. But that being said, with climate change, increasing water increasing increasing water clarity and things like that and runoff, toxic algal blooms are likely to increase in the future, especially during dry years. And so that's just something that, you know, is something we're gonna have to deal with and try to mitigate for. That's bad, Homer. <laughs> so next steps, we wanna look at the associated water quality data. Like I mentioned before, we collect water quality at the same time that we collect the phytoplankton samples. So we have this, these associated uh, abiotic data that may help give a better explanation of what's going on in the community. We'd like to publish the results, even though it seemed like there's a whole lot enough. It, it's good to know that, you know, when you're, the year that we picked a sample happened to be the third wettest year on record. So, you know, just sort of luck of the draw. So, but it's still interesting results to, to see that and have it, have a, a you know a discussion about it. and we're hoping that this will inform uh, phytoplankton monitoring efforts in the delta and beyond you know sampling types vary based upon what you want to do what phytoplankton you're trying to target these are whole water samples some people sample habs with nets and things like that and uh, my uh, supervisor Ted Flitt has a poster about that upstairs about the results that they saw with net sampling versus whole water sampling so I just want to say thank you to the DEMP staff and um uh, they did a lot of work and a lot of people during that time period helping out. So, and that's it. If you have any questions, I'd take them now. Thank you, Tiffany. I, any questions in the, any questions in the audience? Go ahead. Uh, I was happy to see that there is no differences, of course, these are samples taken in the channels. So yeah. obviously if you're like, see a visual surface scum, like in a marina or something might be different, but I was wondering if um, your program has ever looked at the difference between the Van Dorns and the pumping. So I was also saying that that was also kind of reflected in that, that it suggests that you're not getting any disruption of the you know larger colonies through the pump, which is also a good thing. So yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, we've been using the flow through system for a while, but our shore based stations before we had like fixed sites there, like buildings where we could go sample, we used a Van Dorn there for many, many years. So that's something that I think we could maybe look at the data we already have and see if there's a difference. But again, like you mentioned, the, the channel we do sample in the channel, places like Frank's tract, things like that, it's shallow. Our boat can't get in there. Like if it's in the tract itself, it's a flooded island, right? You're not taking a large boat like the Sentinel in there. But uh, to my to my knowledge, I, I think there could be some disruption of that, but but the other thing too, looking at those microcystis scores, we just didn't see a lot on the surface. I feel like if we had seen a lot on the surface, it would have been reflected in the surface samples. And even when they, they, they get broke, if they do get broken up through the flow through system, it still shows up in the counted data when we get it back from the contractor if there's a lot of microcystis in the sample. So, Keith, I mean, okay, I have the microphone. If that's yeah, go ahead. Speed you up. Um, I know you didn't talk about this, but I was just curious if you've ever considered looking at depth, depth, like sort of for tycoplanktonic type of organisms like a Locrosara down. I'm sorry, could you speak up a little bit? I wonder if you've ever looked um, further down in the water column. So, you know, looking for things, tycoplanktonic type of phytoplankton, you know, that hover above the benthos, so they're not truly benthic. And that I wonder how often with these large diatom chains we might be missing. Yeah, that's a great question. We haven't done a depth integrated uh, study, but um, <clears throat> I think it'd be interesting to do for sure. But I definitely with 2019, when you think about the amount of flow needed to suspend those things in the water column, I think that's probably less of an issue during the time that we did this study. But that being said, when the water gets stratified, definitely there's something that you're not seeing if you're not doing a depth integrated sample for sure, so. Yeah, hi, uh, interesting talk. Um, so it's my understanding that Van Dorns are used for samples, sampling at depth normally. So I'm just wondering uh, if, how, like how you use them to surface the sa to sample the surface water and if it's possible that you were missing like, you know, a thin layer of algae at the top, right at the top. Um, so I wasn't out on the boat to do this, but uh, my understanding is that it was trying to take it from like, you know, one side of the boat, you know, just get it just barely under the water, just submerge it and then close it. So, and it's, it's a fairly large, you know, it's about like this. And so it gets a pretty big water sample that we mix in a churn bucket. And then we take a subsample for, from that to preserve. So I don't think we're really missing that because again, that, that mixing that's done with the sample when it's taken, we were trying to see if there's anything, you know, we, we don't want to go too depth 
too deep because we've got the one meter depth sample. So it's definitely just trying to keep it at the surface, but submerge it entirely. So we get a good chunk of what that surface water is there. So you gotcha. Is that, oh, we still have time for questions. Anyone else? What? Go ahead. <laughs> Time. Uh, when microcystis is stuck on the surface, is it, doesn't that is is it still alive or does it start getting photo bleached and killed from the sun when it's at the surface? So yeah, I, so it, that, I think that depends on like the age of the colony, you know, because they do like to float. They have they make those gas vesicles that help get them up to the surface where they get better light. They do tolerate high light conditions better than say diatoms do. But I don't know what what threshold, you know, whatever the irradiance is that would start to kill them. I, that I couldn't speak to, sorry. One Go more, ahead. Brian, Lucy. No, 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 well, but they. No, that's what we're going to do next. That's the water quality data because we've got a, a, a turbidity meter and stuff like that. Oh, turbulence. Oh, sorry. Um, I don't know that we measure that actually. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something if, if we can pull that out of the data, I think that would be an interesting next step. Sure. So. Okay. Great. Thank you, Tiffany. All right, um, great. Our next talker or speaker in the lineup is uh, Dr. Ellen Priest, who's a senior environmental scientist at the Department of Water Resources in the Division of Integrated Science. She was formerly at Roberts and Bryant, and her research areas include limnology, water quality, cyanobacteria, uh, monitoring risks, and evaluation. And so Ellen will be speaking to us about nutrient dynamics and cyanobacteria in Stockton. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, so this is a project that I did in collaboration with the Port and City of Stockton and the Central Valley Water Board. And I started this work when I was at Robertson Bryan, but I am doing all the analysis of the data in my new position at DWR. And what we did was looked at cyanobacteria and nutrient dynamics in the Stockton Deep Water Ship Channel in 2022. So cyanobacteria, harmful algal blooms, or CHABs, have been an issue in the Delta since 1999. The Stockton area is recognized as one of those CHAB hotspots in the Delta. Uh, it has persistent seasonal blooms, and these have been present since at least 2012. The severity of the blooms appears to be increasing, and this is exemplified by toxin concentrations that have been measured there. So in 2012, the maximum microcystin measured at that location was 2.1 micrograms per liter, and there was no scum observed. In contrast, in 2020, microcystin was measured at over 1,000 micrograms per liter in the scum sample, and it was characterized by a very dense scum. And in the surrounding water, it was 61.1 micrograms per liter. So there's a big knowledge gap on CHABs in these hot spots across the Delta. There was one preliminary study in the Stockton area in 2012, um, and it began to characterize nutrient dynamics in the area, but there really were left with a lot of questions about what's going on there. So some questions, what is the spatial and temporal variability of CHABs in the Stockton area? Why are some areas more prone to development of dense sea hubs? And by this, I mean, why is the area closer to the city of Stockton appear to have a denser bloom than just downstream of there? It's unclear if toxins persist the entire growing season. A lot of the toxin sampling has been opportunistic. People grab, get grab samples and send it in, and there's been no consistent monitoring of toxins at that location. So it's also unclear when toxins are most severe, if there's some type of seasonal pattern to that. So this is our study area. Um, so this is the Stockton Deepwater Ship Channel. 
and it's integral to the city and port of Stockton's economy. Over 30 large cargo vessels uh, commute down this channel and unload goods at the port of Stockton here. And then they come down here. Number nine is the turning basin. The ships turn around and go back out to sea. So here's I-5. And the area to the east of I-5 is the area known as the Stockton Waterfront. And its terminus is at the city of Stockton. Although this whole reach is known as the deep water ship channel, really those large ships do not go past the turning basin here. And the shallow, uh, the channel shallows dramatically as you go east. Um, of I-5. So uh, these different numbers represent the locations where we collected samples. The orange dots are our five primary sampling locations. These blue dots are other studies that were co-occurring in 2022 and measuring toxins, and this was by Restore the Delta and Nautilus, and so we were able to incorporate their toxin results into our findings. And then these green dots are three additional sites that we uh, sampled a few times for sediment nutrient dynamics. So for our field methodology, we had 11 sampling events, three of those um, once a month in May, October, and November, and then we did bi-monthly in June through September. We used a YSI EXO to collect water quality parameters at one meter increments at those five primary sampling sites. And then we collected surface water samples. Those were analyzed for nutrients cyanotoxins via LCMS and a qualitative microscopy. We also collected water from the bottom of the water column using a chemerer and measured nutrients. And then on those three events, we collected um, sediments and pore water. So this was at eight different locations, the five primary sites and those three green dots from the last map. We collected sediments using a PONAR sampler where we measured total phosphorus, metals, total organic carbon, and then looked at the composition of the sediment. And then we used a centrifuge to take pore waters off the sediment so that we could measure total phosphorus in the pore waters to try to see if there's some internal nutrient loading occurring. So the first thing we wanted to do was look to see if there was good agreement between the top and bottom of the water column. So the top is here on the y-axis and then the corresponding um, bottom samples are along the top of the x-axis here. So this blue center line where all these dark blue circles are is where each the top and bottom temperature meet, DO, et cetera. So the darker and larger blue the circle, the more positive correlation. And as you can see, we have really good agreement between all of our top and bottom samples. And so we treated them the same moving forward. So we had a lot of data to look at and to visualize it, we plotted it on a principal component analysis. So this is a biplot showing the first two principal components and they are displaying the most variance. And there's a lot going on on this figure, but um, what I want you to take away from it is over here on the right is where we have a lot of the parameters most associated with cyanobacteria. So we had high visual index scores, high chlorophyll, phycocyanin, really high pH and DO. And that is where McLeod Lake separates out. So McLeod Lake is the terminus at the uh, city of Stockton. That's like where the channel dead ends and is most shallow. And as you can see, it really separates out from the other sites. So we have the Turning Basin and Morelli Boat Ramp here. Morelli Boat Ramp is just to the east of I-5. Turning Basin is where the ships turn around. And then completely separate is the San Joaquin River near Calveras and Rough and Ready Island East. This is about four and a half kilometers upstream of McLeod Lake site. So next I wanna show you some chlorophyll that we took. So this is with that YSI XO, so it's not lab-based chlorophyll measurement. So it just gives you a general indication of the chlorophyll in the water column. So each of these panels represents a different date from May through September, so nine sampling dates. We have water depth on the Y axis and then the five primary sampling sites on the X axis. And what you can see is that chlorophyll was pretty much consistently highest at the McLeod Lake site, with the exception of June 23rd, it was highest at the Turning Basin site. Down here in September 20th, there appears to be little to no chlorophyll. And this is when under the microscope, we saw a shift from a microcystis dominated assemblage um, to diatoms here at the end of September. 
So these pictures are to show you how the microcystis presented differently um, east and west of the I-5 bridge. So on the right here, these are the pictures from the McLeod Lake site. Under the microscope, the microcystis looks very similar. In this particular picture, there's a epiphytic uh, diatom that's present. We did see that at the up or at the downstream sites as well, um, but it was more common at the McLeod Lake site, probably just because there were more of those healthy microcystis colonies there. Then um, zooming out a little bit on the right, you can see these small little dense colonies of microcystis at McLeod Lake. But then when you get in that main channel where it's deeper, you're starting to see these lettuce-like bright green flakes. And that's what typically characterizes blooms in the main channels throughout the Delta. And then taking a step even further back, you can see these like oily streaks here um, that are commonly attributed to microcystis blooms. And the water looks kind of more brown from a distance in the um, deeper sites. So moving on to microcystins. So these are the microcystins from our study and then the other studies as well. And we had by far the highest microcystin concentrations at McCod Lake. Taking a step back, we did look for multiple cyanotoxins in our samples and we only detected microcystin. We did not detect any of the other cyanotoxins. So the highest microcystin was measured um, September 20th, 270 micrograms per liter at McLeod Lake. It's worth noting that the Morelli boat ramp site, so once again, that's just east of the I-5 bridge, there were dense blooms there as well. Visually, it looked like we had that swirly patterns, really thick microcystis, um, but the toxin maximum that we measured was 5.9 micrograms per liter. So these lines are the danger horizontal lines warning and caution thresholds that the state uses uh, to recommend people and animals um, protect themselves from microcystin. And except for these two samples here on August 24th, all of the other toxin measurements outside of McLeod Lake were below the warning threshold of six micrograms per liter. And the majority of them um, where those flakes were dominant, not those teeny colonies were below the caution threshold of 0 0.8 micrograms per liter. So I just wanted to do a quick comparison. Why did we see so much more microcystin 2020 versus 2022? Well, we don't have the comprehensive data set to compare the two years, um, but I pulled air temperature and just plotted that because I wanted to see if there was any obvious differences in temperature. And to me, there didn't seem to be um, much difference. There were similar number of days above 100. So why was it less toxic? I can't answer that exactly, but the bloom appeared to be less dense than it was in 2020. Maybe there were different strains present that would take genetic analysis. Maybe our sampling didn't capture the most uh, toxic portion of the bloom. We had a big sampling gap from the end of August to September. Um, and that's, if you remember, when we had that peak heat wave. Um, so maybe we missed toxin, the peak toxin measurement, or maybe the samplers in 2020 just got lucky and they captured uh, the peak toxin measurement. Moving on to other water quality parameters, um, the median water temperatures were warm. They're at above 25 uh, C at all the sites from June to September, but they were warmest at McLeod Lake often up to 27, 28 degrees Celsius, and that was throughout the entire water column. Uh, the water was very well oxygenated. In the samples west of the I-5 bridge, they have dissolved, pure dissolved oxygen being pumped into the water uh, to deal with low DO issues, and so maybe that's part of the reason why we had such good oxygen. But oxygen conditions at McLeod Lake were super saturated, 12.5, um, um, milligrams per liter of dissolved oxygen was the median DO measured. We also had really high pH at the McLeod Lake site. It was between nine and 10 throughout the peak of the summer. Um, so I think the microcystis was really driving that high pH. And that was once again, throughout the entire water column. So now moving on to nutrients in the water column, there's a lot going on in this figure. Um, but what I really wanna point out to you is that the nutrients were high across all the sites. So total phosphorus and phosphate are the top two panels. Then we have total nitrogen 
nitrate and ammonia. These black dotted lines are thresholds from the literature. Um, and if nutrients are over that, it suggests that there's non-limiting amounts available for uh, cyanobacteria growth. For total nitrogen, it ranges somewhere between 0.35 and two milligrams per liter. I put the most conservative um, threshold on here. But as you can see, we had high nutrients, plenty of nutrients for these cyanobacteria to thrive at all of the sites uh, across the summer. So now we're moving into the sediment. So uh, as I mentioned, we used a ponar to collect our sediment samples and scraped the top part off of those and transported them to the lab. We looked at um, the grain size of those sediments. And what we found is that the majority of our sites had very fine clay-like sediments. The exception to that was the Morelli boat ramp site here, which had about half gravel and half fine sediments. So that may have been driven just by the boat traffic in that area. Um, so high fine sediments suggest, you know, high potential for phosphorus in the sediments. Total phosphorus ranged from 300 to 500 micrograms per kilogram in the sediment. And we also had high iron to phosphorus ratios, which you know, suggests there's um, increased potential for internal phosphorus loading. So moving on to the pore waters, uh, this first figure was just to look at how pore waters uh, differed across sites. Um, there wasn't an actual significant difference in pore water total phosphorus across sites, but at the turning basin here, uh, it was almost two times as high as the other locations. When we compared pore water to the um, water column, we found significantly higher total phosphorus in the pore water than the water column. This indicates there's potential for the internal phosphorus cycling. So we have four main conclusions, and I will caveat this by saying I'm still working through finalizing um, all of the data analysis, but we had a clear gradient of bloom severity um, at, occurring at the McLeod Lake site, and it decreased in severity as you moved west, but there were colonies present throughout the entire area. Uh, overall, the toxin concentrations were low outside of McLeod Lake. And visually the bloom, you couldn't just look at the water column and see if the bloom was toxic. Um, for example, in June, we had very dense blooms and there was no toxicity observed. Uh, second, nutrients and temperature are sufficient to support microcystis growth throughout the deep water ship channel from at least June through September. Uh, even into November, we saw colonies at the Stockton waterfront area when water temps were 15 degrees. Um, they may have just been left over. They weren't necessarily growing, but there were still quite a few in the water column. Microcystis at McLeod Lake appears to engineer their own environment. Uh, they are driving really high pH and DO. We weren't out there at night to measure, but usually this correlates with large sags in the evening, um, which would cause high respiration rates that promote um, internal nutrient cycling. Um, and legacy phosphorus in the sediment and pore water likely plays an important role. We'll need further study to confirm that, um, but it likely plays an internal important role in internal nutrient loading. And that's important because even if you were to control external nutrient loading, you're still gonna have a big nutrient problem in the Stockton deep water ship channel. So our recommendations for next steps is to really have a consistent uh, routine water quality monitoring program at that location. Uh, further evaluate sediment nutrient dynamics by using mesocosms and um, further looking at the internal nutrient cycling. We thought it'd be interesting to assess the impact of large boats on water quality. So maybe those boats that are going through the deeper part of the channel are disrupting blooms or preventing them from forming. And then, you know, eventually everyone would like to mitigate the problem. Um, more monitoring will help inform what the best mitigation measures are, um, but we suggest a focus on physical controls. We don't think, um, especially in the short term, that nutrient controls are going to have much of any impact in that area. So I just want to acknowledge the port and city of Stockton. Uh, the port of Stockton lent us their boat a couple of times, and then Central Valley Water Board provided their boat and staff time to collect these samples and then restore the Delta for kindly sharing their toxin data with us. 
And with that, here's my contact info. Thank you. We have time for questions. Yes. What kind of physical actions do you think? Well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly. I think there needs to be some type of evaluation, but I think even just there could be pipes circulating the water down there and some type of circular motion. Um, they do have bubble line diffusers currently, and they're doing nothing at this point. So something stronger than what is currently there. It's not a simple solution either. <laughs> Thanks for your talk. I'm just curious about the phosphorus and the uh, poor concentrations of that. Would it make sense to try to disturb the sediment as a potential other mitigator? Um, well, possibly. Um, west of the I-5 bridge, there is some dredging that occurs because they have to keep it at a certain depth for the boats to pass. I am still waiting to hear back from the port on the frequency of that, but there's dredging occurring and there's still high nutrients. So I don't know how much sediment removal or, or movement would have much, if any, impact. Yes. No, I can't do that with the data that I have, but that's just a suggestion for future research. That's Janice's idea. <laughs> well, I don't know if you could do it with satellite coverage and turbidity, but being out there when a ship has passed, it's like, oh, that th those propellers get all the way down to the bottom. It, it's quite a dramatic difference. All right, I think that's all our time. So you can talk to Ellen at the break. Um, the next. All right, our final speaker in this session is, uh, is Trisha Lee. She's a senior environmental scientist at the Delta Science Program and has a master's in marine biology. Uh, her areas of interest include biogeochemistry, water quality and contaminants, She's also leading the development of a cyanobacterial strategy, uh, which you'll hear about next. Thanks, Trisha. Thank you, Keith, for that introduction. All right, so I'm gonna be talking today about um, a workshop that the Delta Science Program put on in November, 2022. Um, that's going to be, hopefully what we're trying to do with this is build toward a coordinated partner monitoring strategy for harmful algal blooms in the Delta. So I was set up very well by Ellen's talk. I don't think I need to belabor the point anymore about how much <clears throat> harmful algal blooms are really starting to become an issue for the Delta. Um, there's, it's really well recognized across many different platforms, statewide, estuary-wide, and Delta-wide. Um, and so the efforts that we, that we went through to put on this workshop and also to get into the development of this monitoring strategy um, we're really well supported by a lot of other works that had already been done. So um, we have really were able to, and this is a non-exhaustive list of what some of those resources might look like, but these are some of the ones that we really use for this effort. Um, so including such things as this statewide fresh, um, freshwater harmful algal bloom framework and monitoring strategy, as well as the Delta RMP nutrient research plan. So you should see some familiar names here. And then at our agency, the Delta Stewardship Council, we also have a vested interest in um, harmful algal blooms, which is demonstrated through many of the works that we have put out. So if you saw Dan Constable's talk yesterday, he talked about the Delta plan and how we use the Delta plan to um, advance different priority areas in the Delta. And there is a performance measure for um, reducing spatial coverage of freshwater harmful algal blooms in the Delta. Um, also in 2019, the Delta Science Plan called had an action to call for evaluation of monitoring programs where there may be gaps. Harmful algal blooms are one of those gaps in monitoring programs. 
Um, the 2022 Science Action Agenda, which came out last year, or of course, I just said 2022, they also had two priority science action, um, which were calling for how we might be able to better address harmful algal bloom research needs. And the Delta Science Program, as well as other entities, use the science action agenda, science action agenda to identify um, priority research areas for funding. And then the State of Bay Delta Science, which was published just last month, also included a synthesis chapter on harmful algal blooms with a Bay Delta scope. And the, the mission of the Delta Science Program is to provide the best information for decision making. So workshops are one of the ways in which we do that, where we can have this kind of community-based and collaborative approach to um, identifying what that best, best possible information looks like. So this was really born out of um, Department of Fish and Wildlife and the Central Valley Regional Water Board, Janice, again, um, approached the science program to host this workshop in order to kind of align thoughts on this. Um, the uh, There's really broad recognition beyond these couple of groups, and there was a a great um, number of entities that were involved in this workshop itself. But um, really the need for this was that there needs to be consistency around HABs monitoring, data collection, and data sharing um, and with the ultimate goal to develop this monitoring strategy. And I just put up here for fun this conceptual model that was developed for the workshop, which shows you kind of landscape scale um, effects on harmful algal blooms. And I'll show you where you can get that later if you're interested. So the workshop format itself, um, we're opened by assembly member Bill Quirk, who is the author of AB 834, um, which established the freshwater and estuary and harmful algal bloom for the state of Cal harmful algal bloom program for the state of California. Uh, we also had a keynote by Dr. Peggy Lehman, who, um, as many of you know, has spent the last couple of decades really looking at the different, the microcystis issues in Delta. Um, we broke out after thinking about how we wanted to build toward this monitoring strategy, we broke out the format of the workshop to cover two thematic areas. On the first day, we had discussions around creating a coordinated mo monitoring strategy. And on the second day, we talked about data sharing and integration. Um, and each day fo followed a similar format where in the morning we had presentations by experts in the field and followed by panel discussions by folks who were able to um, kind of expound on some of the areas of issue areas that we had discussed. And then in the afternoon, we had an excellent opportunity to hear from the participants of the workshop itself. So um, this was a key thing that we were really interested in was hearing from the participants and the attendees of this workshop to get their ideas about where the gaps in data collection are and where their interest areas for creating some kind of monitoring strategy would be. And then the workshop was also recapped and closed out by the Delta Lee scientist, Dr. Laurel Larson. So I'm gonna spend a few slides going through what our major take homes that we heard were. So I talked about how we were really interested in hearing the participants from the participants. One of the ways that we did this at a really high level is we opened each day with a menti poll. Um, so I don't expect you to read the really tiny text on this slide, um, but I'm just gonna pull out some major things that we heard here. So on the first day we asked folks what their desired outcomes of a coordinated monitoring strategy are. And the three major responses were greater understanding of HAB drivers. Elm kind of spoke to this as well, that there's, you know, there are some knowns, but there are a lot of unknowns about what HAB drivers are, um, what are the greatest HAB drivers in different areas. Uh, more consistent data collection was another area of interest. I mentioned briefly at the outset that there is no long-term funding or monitoring program for harmful algal blooms specifically. And that is a need that many people thought was important. Um, and then also um, this last response, better working relationships between monitoring groups, um, I think really ties into the answers to the next questions. The next question. So the next question was asking folks about what they think the biggest barriers to accessing or using data is. Um, and 
So I think a lot of the responses here, so the first one was data is in a format that is difficult to obtain. Um, that might be that data is just not uploaded or data is um, not accessible in the way that folks need it to be to be able to do what they need to do as a data user. QAQC information is not available, so they may, may not be able to use the data for reasons of not knowing how it was collected or the metadata surrounding it. And also a key point that we heard and um, is a little bit on the unique side for harmful algal blooms is that data takes too long to be uploaded. And this really speaks to the public health angle that monitoring for harmful algal blooms has. Um, it's a little bit more unique to this type of collection of data because many of the other environmental monitoring that goes on in the Delta does not need to have this really rapid response or rapid turnover of data in order to make a public health um, noticing or any kind of decision regarding public, um, public health and public access to waters. And I think these answers also really kind of tie into this um, better working relationships where there's uh, maybe not working relationships, but not knowing where to go to get the information that you need. So um, another discussion that we had was around different tools that are available that <clears throat> we do have available for looking at harmful algal blooms. Um, a common one is the microcystis index. It's an example of something that is really uh, low cost, low training effort. You can really take it out and conduct this kind of microcystis index anywhere. And it really gives you a really quick yes, no, is there microcystis out there or not? It does have its limitations, of course. This um, Another tool that's on this screen is the satellite, the SFEI satellite, which can be used to um, identify areas where there's high growth and um, be kind of like a cursory look at where monitoring might be able to be targeted. Um, I mentioned the conceptual models. I showed you one at the outset of the talk and we we developed these um, conceptual models. I should say really Keith and Jenna developed these um, conceptual models to show how different um, drivers are influencing bloom development in the Delta. So there was a landscape scale one, which I showed, and then there was also more of a water parcel scale one. Um, and also the, the map on the slide that has all of the dots on it, this is something that was made by Dr. Karen Atkins from um, Central Valley Regional Water Board, now CDFW, and also Jenna Rindy from CDFW. They made all these maps where they overlaid different monitoring efforts across the Delta for different parameters that are useful for harmful algal bloom monitoring. Um, so what it shows us is that there is actually this like really great spatial coverage of where parameters that are of interest for harmful algal bloom development are already being collected. Um, and it really gives us a great idea of, you know, there is a lot of data out there. It's just maybe making some kind of strategic approach. So all of this and more can be found at this QR code. If you're interested, we included a lot of this information in the pre-workshop materials that we developed for the workshop, and they're all available on this research gate page. Um, so if you're interested in seeing any of this in more detail, I encourage you to go to that bit.ly link or the QR code. So the next couple of slides, I'm gonna show you um, some major things that we heard during breakout group discussions. Um, we, uh, these are some examples of questions that we posed to folks in these afternoon breakout group discussions. Um, we were really trying to uh, ask questions that would elicit responses that are gonna help inform the forthcoming monitoring strategy. So we asked folks about um, ongoing work, challenges to collecting or sharing or accessing data, <clears throat> the public health dimension, and um, yeah, additional just data and information sharing. And what I'm gonna show you is this word cloud, which just shows you, um, this is all the responses to the breakout group questions that have been fed into a word cloud to show us kind of the major things that people are thinking about. And I think some of this is not too surprising to see. There's HABs, there's monitoring, there's data. Um, but the, again, there is this, 
um, component of the funding and the resources, which I've mentioned, there are not consistent funding and resources dedicated specifically for this. Um, there's also this pub public and health aspect, which I think um, is really something that is at the forefront of many people's minds. Um, and this workshop, what I'm also seeing here is that this workshop was open to the public. We had people from our kind of regular, who you would expect, our state and federal agency uh, members we and academic folks, but also we had um, community-based organizations. We had some members of community-based organizations from the watershed as well as in the Delta as well, and out, out to the estuary. And we had, um, you know, people who are just really interested in figuring out this harmful algal blooms pro program or issue maybe in their own system. So we also had a collective of folks that were calling in from Australia and like all over just, this is a really cross cutting area of interest for many different people for different reasons. So the prominent topics that we heard at the end of this workshop, um, there is a consistent, uh, we consistently heard that there was a need for standardization of practices. That's from sample collection methods to um, data storage and sharing and accessibility. And this also kind of spoke to the usability of data, that data synthesis and integration uh, would be really should be really improved to increase the ability of um, the ability and the usability of the data. And the public health dimension really cannot be lost, that this is a unique area where um, data accessibility, data needs to be accessible for public health protection and the end user is not always the same as the um, person who might be collecting that data. And there needs to be maybe the system of rapid communication between these different uh, groups. And I think it can't be said enough that there is no long-term funding associated with long-term monitoring of harmful algal blooms. Uh, there have been special studies but the baseline understanding of before a bloom develops is a lot of the data that has been collected is in response to a bloom rather than understanding the baseline before a bloom develops. Um, so some of these, there needs to be dedicated funding for both the long-term monitoring as well as filling knowledge gaps um, through special studies. Okay, so... Next steps, if you want to see more about what we talked about in the workshop, we released this workshop summary last month. Um, there is also going to be a forthcoming monitoring strategy. We did release a draft monitoring strategy, which included what we thought were the um, prioritized management questions for such a monitoring strategy in this draft form. Uh, those can all be found at this bit.ly link as well, or the QR code. Um, and my contact information is here. But I do have to say, I think Keith said that I was the lead for the monitoring strategy. I am not the lead for the monitoring strategy. I also would not call myself the um, expert on harmful algal blooms, but rather all of these folks on the screen really dedicated their time and energy of which they likely did not have very much. And they really gave so much to be able to put on this workshop um, through a meeting constantly and telling me, no, Trisha, that's not right. <laughs> you need to course correct here and getting us to the finish line to be able to put the workshop on. Um, and the true lead authors for the monitoring strategy are going to be Ellen Kreese and Manet Berg. Um, so really enormous thank you to all these folks. I It was really not me. I was more of a facilitator than anything else. And so with that, I think I'll take any questions. Before we get to questions, so, Trisha is selling herself short. She did a great job as a lead facilitator, <laughs> and we're really indebted for your leadership of that whole team. But we do have some time for some questions. Thank you. Sorry, Bruce, I beat you this time. <laughs> <laughs> um, Trisha, thank you for your talk. So I'm curious if at the workshop there was any discussion on the spatial coverage that people want for Sinohab monitoring. 
And the reason I ask that is just with Ellen's talk, it seems like there might be some real critical spaces in the Delta that where we want really good coverage. And the idea of incorporating monitoring into existing programs would prompt a much more dispersed coverage. And then the other part about a developing a monitoring strategy is hopefully there was discussion about key covariates that need to be tracked as well. And any new or um, expanded monitoring program would need to really have those covariates tracked so that there could be analyses to look at some of the mechanisms underlying blooms, right? So just curious your, your thoughts on that. Thank you. Yes, definitely. Okay, so <clears throat> we're the on the first topic of the spatial coverage, um, we we first, you know, wanted to scale way in and really just focus on the Delta and Cyanohabs. And um, part of the reason that we thought this made the most sense to start at this kind of small scale is because even though, you know, we, we totally admit we have upstream and downstream neighbors, these people are also, you know, having the effects of the cyanohabs or are otherwise maybe contributing some kind of driver to the cyanohabs that are occurring. And the reason that um, I think Meredith Howard said this really well, um, she gave a talk on monitoring strategies and starting at like this smaller scale with the intent to build out from there. Because um, I think, you know, we got to take this at we're encountering kind of like a really large problem. And so we're taking this at a step-by-step -step or like bite-by-bite -bite process where we'll start at this Delta level spatial scale and then move out um, with cer certainly acknowledging that there are implications of what we do for folks outside of the Delta. And then on the covariates piece, so maybe I'll just provide some additional information on what the monitoring strategy will, what the intent of the monitoring strategy is um, the monitoring strategy will not necessarily set up a monitoring program. It will provide um, recommendations of what best practices for or where areas of interest might be for additional special studies, um, as well as recommendations for um, how monitoring might be best incorporated into different um, different areas where people might be interested in developing some kind of program. So I think that covariates concept is something that would be maybe included in those recommendations. Um, but the strategy itself doesn't come with any funding. And so it is going to be more of a strategy with recommendations for how we get to the next step. And we also very much recognize that this monitoring strategy is not the end all be all. This is something that is to get us a baseline understanding to be able to build toward some eventual, you know, we all would love to see a harmful algal blooms forecasting system, but we got to scale way back and we're working at this um, more uh, baseline scale for this. All right, I think, oh. yeah. I think that's all the time we have for questions, but the good news is um, we have the poster session now. And so there's time, um, we have a little bit of a time to mingle with one another. Um, and then we'll be back here at 1110 for the zooplankton session. So I want to thank all our speakers again for this water quality session. And thanks to Janice. And yeah, I encourage you all to find any speakers if you have any remaining questions. And we'll see you back here at 1110 for zooplankton. Okay, hi everybody. I am Christina Bardi. I am with CDFW um, and probably a lot of you that are in here already know me um, from the zooplankton PWT, but um, I am happy to now move up the food web from phytoplankton and water quality and uh, have a little zooplankton party with Denise Colombano starting out. And let me see if I can figure out how to do this. And so Denise is going to talk about assessing phenological shifts in zooplankton and forage fishes with dynamic linear models. Up to you, Luke. Can you hear me? Okay. 
Hi, everyone. I'm Denise. Um, today, I'm going to be presenting on my research uh, from my postdoc at UC Berkeley, where I was working with Albert Ruhi and Stephanie Carlson. Um, this is a California Department, Department of Fish and Wildlife Prop 1 funded grant. Um, and I just wanted to say that if at the end of this talk, you find yourself interested in time series models um, and using long term data, uh, feel free to get in touch with me. I can help you get in touch with Albert. He's a time series guru. He's really excited to ramp up his research in the Delta. And so with all the availability of long-term data, there are basically endless questions that can be answered with these types of models um, that are actually really fun to work on. Okay, so in the spirit of promoting the IEP project work teams, um, a group of us at the IEP Climate Change Project Work Team recently completed a literature review on climate change effects on San Francisco estuary aquatic ecosystems as open access and SPUs. And one of our main points of emphasis is that climate change is here, it's happening, and the estuary is experiencing shifting baseline conditions, amplification of extremes, and restructuring of physical habitats and biological communities. We conceptualize in this paper how climate change alterations to the timing, frequency, magnitude, and spatial extent of environmental drivers may impact different ecosystem types. So on the global scale, we're seeing changes in air temperature, precipitation, and sea level. On the regional scale, we're seeing changes in water temperature, freshwater flow, the salinity gradient, and sediment supply. And on a local scale, we're seeing changes to water quality variables like water temperature, salinity, and suspended sediment, um, which are then impacting open water habitat and their food webs, which is what I'm gonna be focusing on today. Okay, so there's a lot going on, so I'm gonna walk you through this. One of the potential impacts of climate change um, that we didn't write much about in our review because there's not that much out there yet here is change to species phenology or the timing of important life history events like spawning, migration, or peak abundance. So for our Prop 1 project, we hypothesize that changes in climatic trends, fluctuations, and extremes would affect river outflows, which would then affect local temperatures, salinity, nutrients, etc. in the delta. We hypothesize that such changes would elicit phenological responses in aquatic organisms, such as migration and dispersal, spawning, and peak production, and that in turn, these phenological responses would affect trophic interactions. So in terms of top-down effects, um, that would be forage fish predation on zooplankton, zooplankton consumption of phytoplankton, or in terms of bottom-up effects, that would be resource availability to consumers. And specifically, we hypothesize that if the seasonal timing of resources and consumers overlapped, this would constitute a trophic match um, and result in high juvenile recruitment of juvenile fishes or forage fishes. But alternatively, alternatively, if the seasonal timing didn't overlap, this may constitute a trophic mismatch. And in this case, that would be predators with too few prey and result in low juvenile recruitment of forage fishes. So this is the basis of our uh, proposal. So in terms of phenology, we hypothesize that changes to phenology could occur in several ways. For example, on the left panels, there's a historical distribution of peak abundance. Now a species could advance its timing or delay its timing of peak abundance or it could be widening or narrowing the window or the width of its peak abundance. So the overarching question for our study is, do zooplankton and forage fishes shift their phenology in response to changing environmental conditions? So we set out to study the phenology of zooplankton, which are key resources for forage fishes in this estuary. And we used publicly accessible long-term monitoring data from the EMP zooplankton Clark Bumpus Net and the CDFW Bay Study Midwater Trawl. 
Both of these surveys have sampled sets of stations near each other on a monthly basis since 1995 and can be used as a paired station design along the salinity gradient from the lower Sacramento River to Sa San Pablo Bay. And I just want to give a shout out to Sam Bashevkin and others who have worked tirelessly on making this data easily accessible to data, data users such as me through packages like Zooper and Delta Fish. Okay, is there a red dot? Someone else is controlling that, it's not me. <laughs> okay, well, anyways, uh, glad you saw the important parts of the slides that I was pointing out. Um, okay, so to, to address our question, we decided to use dynamic linear models which are a special case of state space models. So a DLM captures relationships between a predictor and a response variable in a time varying fashion by fitting a random walk for each parameter of the regression. That is one for the slope and one for the intercept. And it updates these parameters at each time step. If you're interested in this, I just wanna plug my lab mate, Kyle Leather's paper in limnology and oceanography. He figured out how to do this um, and a multivariate DLM. And so I'm following in his footsteps and I can email you a copy of his paper. Okay, there it is again. We constructed multivariate DLMs that allowed for spatial covariance among our six stations. I have no idea. Oh, I wonder if that's from my IEPA talk last year. Okay, yeah. I'm so sorry. Okay, so DLMs have two equations. The combine a model for the state process, which is in this case, the true timing with a model for the observation process or the noisy observations um, that we observe. So it achieves this by fitting that random walk for each parameter where you get a unique intercept and slope for each time and it's conditioned on the previous time step. And this is different than a regular linear model which would give you a unique intercept and slope for the entire time series. So it can incorporate <clears throat> it can incorporate um, time varying effects, um, time varying covariates such as temperature and salinity, and also incorporate observation error. Okay, so here's some data. Um, as you know, water quality in the estuary varies seasonally. So in order to include phenology, which is a timing metric, and water quality, which varies with time we have to de-season the water quality data by calculating, in this case, anomalies or departures from expected values based on long-term seasonal averages. And we sum them for the last three months to incorporate a signal, a seasonal signal. So two main points about these plots are one, if you look at the colored lines, there's a substantial spatial covariance among these stations for all three variables, SECI, surface salinity, and surface temperature. But there are noticeable differences with upstream most station in purple. You can see some big peaks in purple and the downstream most station in yellow. And <clears throat> they have much higher peaks and troughs than the other stations in the middle of the estuary. And recent trends suggest that these sites have become clearer, saltier, and warmer, particularly during the drought period. And for today's talk, I'm gonna be um, focusing on temperature. Okay, so for the phonology metrics. So we've followed established methods by Rebecca Ash's lab. She's kind of a pioneer in looking at phonology of larval time, larval fishes over time um, at East Carolina University. And so we characterized the timing of peak abundance using a low smoother. And then we calculated the quantiles. So we have a lower quantile, a medium, median quantile and upper quantile to characterize that peak, that seasonal peak each year. So for instance, the red dot, which is the uh, lower quantile represents the day of the year when 15% of catch for that entire year occurred. And that's what I'm gonna be focusing on in my models. So it's the beginning of the peak. Okay, so here's some plots summarizing the trends in these metrics. Um, so we have lower, median, upper, and then on the right duration, which is just subtracting 
lower from upper to look at the width of the peak. And the open circles represent station level values and black circles represent the among station averages. And this, in this example for America Shad, it suggests that um, when the timing of the quantiles shift, um, <clears throat> the width of the peak or the number of days, the duration can narrow or widen through time. Just one observation. Here's another example for Pseudodidapnemus forbesi, a calanoid copepon. And it's an example of a prey species that consistently widened its peak over time. So this is more of a monotonic trend. And basically the lower quantile trends earlier and the upper quantile trends later. And as a result, you have a wider peak. Okay, so for specific study questions, is there evidence of directional shifts in species phenology? Is there evidence of time varying relationships between species phenology and environmental conditions? And if so, are the time varying relationships consistent across space and time? Okay, so there's a lot going on in this plot, so I'm gonna walk you through it. Um, this is the model results from pseudodaptimus um, temperature effects on the timing um, that, of that lower quantile, so when the peak begins each year. So the top row is the DLM fitted values for the response variable, the timing. The middle row is the sum of the temperature analogies three months prior to the, that date. And then the bottom row is the time varying effect of temperature on timing. That's the slope. And the columns are stations um, along the estrin gradient where purple is in the delta and yellow is in San Pablo Bay. Okay, so what did we find? Well, pseudoaptimus timing varied. You can see it goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down. But over the time series for each station, it trends earlier. And that's a significant trend. Um, the magnitude of these shifts were stronger downstream, which is interesting. And the temperature anomalies varied throughout the time series and across all stations, and they were greater upstream. So basically the delta had you know, higher variability in temperature. Now, when we get to the relationships, which is the point of the DLM, um, there were time varying um, relationships. You can see that they often switch direction. Um, but they were predominantly negative, um, especially upstream. Okay, so I'm going to walk you through an example of the time varying relationships because they're kind of confusing. Okay, so here is a time series of the slopes. So, <clears throat> and the confidence intervals. So those that are fully above or below zero would be considered a significant slope. So in 1997 and 2017, cooler temperatures were associated with later timing. In these other years, warmer temperatures were associated with earlier timing. Both of those phenomenon result in a negative slope. But in contrast, here's another time series um, that also has these negative slopes, but also has positive slopes where cooler temperatures were associated with earlier timing and warmer temperatures were associated with later timing. So that's an example of the relationship switching throughout time, which you would miss if you just had a single slope, or slope and intercept for a model. Okay, so back to the model results. Um, Bosmina timing varied, but it did not display any directional shifts over the time series. Um, once again, temperature variability was greater upstream. And the time varying of, of, uh, relationships shifted from predominantly negative to predominantly positive across the estrin gradient as a function of going downstream. Yuri Temura displayed significant directional shifts to earlier timing upstream. Temperature variability, once again, was greater upstream. And there were time varying relationships that were stronger upstream and predominantly positive. 
Lastly, for sinocolonists, they displayed significant directional shifts to earlier timing in several, but not all stations. Temperature variability was greater upstream and there were time varying relationships that appeared to be inverse upstream versus downstream. Okay, so that is our first set of models that we um, have actually completed. We got them to converge. We're learning how to interpret them. They're preliminary. And I'm just gonna share what we've learned so far from that exercise. Um, phenology varied throughout the time series. Like I said, it goes up, it goes down for lots of species, but most species shifted the beginning of their peaks earlier over time and at least some stations and commonly upstream when there was greater temperature variability than Delta. With the time varying relationships, these were more consistent for some species than others. Um, some were more negative more of the time, some were more positive more of the time, yeah, but others switched the direction and magnitude in space and time. And lastly, sensitivity to changes in temperature often varied as a function of the estuarine gradient. Some species were more sensitive upstream to changes in temperature, some were more sensitive downstream. Okay, next steps for our analysis are to basically repeat it for your other variables. Um, that includes other phenology metrics and other predictor variables like salinity and secchi. And then we're also going to repeat this for the macrozooplankton, the mycids, and the age zero forage fishes. We just haven't gotten to that yet. And then we're going to select the best models um, using a model selection procedure with the final goal <laughs> of assessing the potential from trophic matches and mismatches. Okay, so I'd like to thank everyone who provided us with project support funding and public data sets and packages. Here's some papers if you're interested in learning more about these methods. And with that, um, feel free to ask me questions here or in the lobby. Um, you can also email me at my new email address at the Delta Council. I am now working with the Delta Science Program. Thanks. All right, thank you, Denise. Um, unfortunately, I don't think we have time for questions, but I'm sure Denise would be happy to talk to anyone after. Uh, next up, let me just pull up. We have uh, Charlie Norton from San Francisco State University speaking about zooplankton transport in the cash flu complex. Hello, everybody. Put my timer up here. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Charlie Norton, and I am a, a graduate student in uh, the Kimmerer Youngbluth Lab at San Francisco State University's Estuary and Ocean Science Center. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about um, some of the work that our lab has done on zooplankton transport in the cash flu complex and how that ties into um, my uh, master's thesis research. So um, we all are a big fan of wetlands um, and we know that they are um, good habitat for fish. They provide a lot of uh, ecosystem services, um, but there is an ongoing question of whether wetlands can export food resources like zooplankton to downstream open water environments, which they're connected to by both river flow and tidal exchange. So our lab particularly focuses on copepods. Um, so that's what we're gonna be talking about today. And um, so there's a question of, you have a wetland that's full of copepods um, on a net level over time, are they being exported downstream or not? Um, and this is a relevant question. If you are a hungry Delta smelt living in one of these downstream open water environments, um, but more broadly, it is also um, a, a, uh, an important question for gauging um, wetlands connection to other habitats in the Delta and um, and what the value of, of restoring wetlands might be and some of the specific um, uh, effects that that sort of restoration might have. And then the other question that this project and um, in the past research I'm gonna be discussing um, hopes to address is how the dial behavior of copepods uh, might impact these potential fluxes into or out of wetlands. So um, copepods are um, they will vibrate, no, they will migrate vertically um, in response, we believe, to light. So 
um, during the daytime when there's a lot of light in the water, and particularly if the water is clear enough for that light to penetrate, they will migrate downward. Um, in a shallow wetland, like a lot of the ones you get in the delta, this means that you're going to have the copepods on the bottom and basically unavailable for tidal transport. Um, whereas at nighttime, when there's little to no light in the water, um, they're abundant in the water column. Um, and so on the top here, um, you can see that, that this is sort of what you would expect if you were just seeing um, sort of a uniform abundance across the whole tidal cycle. You would expect it to, um, to mainly be driven by the tidal cycle, and you could see a net flux out of a wetland. But if there's a differential between the day and night abundances of copepods, then we might be seeing differences in um, in flux. And this is particularly important during the summer when the copepods that we study are abundant because nighttime flood tides tend to be stronger than daytime ebb tides. So that means that the the, uh, the part of the tidal cycle that the copepods are available for is the, uh, is the stronger portion. And that could really affect uh, the types of fluxes that we're seeing. So, um, oops. Hit the wrong key. Um, we are working, or excuse me, I am I'm working from um, two past studies um, that are already completed uh, within the cash flow complex um, and building on them um, to try to try to answer these questions for the cash flow complex. Um, so those two past studies are Kimmer et al. 2015 and Yelton et al. 2018. Um, when I say those years, I'm referring to the year of field sampling for both of those studies, um, not the years of publication. You can see the full publications up there. I encourage you all to read them. They're great. Um, but these two studies both focused on um, our lab's favorite copepod, which is Pseudodiaptinus forbizae. You can see pictured there on the right. Um, and they collected a, a variety of, of data on this copepod, but um, I'm gonna be focusing particularly on um, abundance uh, values that they collected over the course of full tidal cycles, which averaged to about 24.83 hours. Um, and then the subsequent flux calculations that were done with those abundance values. Um, so for um, the uh, maybe zero of you that aren't familiar with the cash slough complex in here, um, there it is a, is a complex of uh, wetlands and sloughs in the North Delta, just to the west of the Sacramento Deep Water Ship Channel. Um, I have my, uh, my crudely mapped up, mapped up uh, a PowerPoint map of it here with a lot of arrows. And uh, one of the more you know, dominant features of it is Liberty Island here in the center, um, which is, uh, has been flooded permanently since 1997. Um, and these two studies took place at the locations you see marked here. So the 2018 study took place in, um, in Wildlands Marsh, which is part of the Liberty Island Conservation Bank, which was restored in 2010. Um, and the 2015 study took place um, at the transition point between Liberty Island and the Lower Cache Slough. So zooming in on, um, on the satellite pictures of both of these sites, um, you can see that they are um, quite different. So the white arrows here represent the direction of water movement um, with which these studies were concerned and the, the locations that were sampled for copepods. Um, and some of the differences between these two sites have to do with sort of their, um, their topography or their bathymetry. Um, so at the Liberty Island site, you can see on the left, um, it, the channel there is much, much broader. Um, the water is deeper there. Um, it gets to about four meters in on Liberty Island and, um, and up to more like uh, 13 meters in the adjacent channels, whereas it's only up to about two meters deep in Wildlands Marsh and the channel is also much wider. So you get much higher flow. Um, and this is um, some plots of the, the flow from both of these sites um, from USGS stations and uh, plotting them on the same y-axis, you can see that uh, the, the flow compared, uh, the flow at Wildlands compared to Liberty Island is, is, is almost invisible on this plot. So there's a big difference in the amount of uh, water that's moving there. Um, there's also differences in turbidity. Um, in general, the turbidity is higher at the lower end of Liberty Island than it is in the Wildlands Marsh. And that might play a role in the amount of light that's penetrating into the water. And again, affecting those copepod uh, migration behaviors. Um, so both of these studies um, uh, sampled for, for Pseudodiaptimus over the course of the full tidal cycle. They did it three times at uh, the dates you see listed on the left for the 2015 study, and four times for the uh, dates you see listed on the right uh, for the 2018 study. And um, the values that I'm going to be discussing uh, for this presentation primarily are uh, copepod abundance, flow, and flux. Um, and um, I've made some handy symbols and the uh, units for those on the left there. And a really important thing to note um, is that when I am using a flow or flux, um, positive numbers mean that the flow is going into the wetland. Negative means that it is coming out. Um, and that's the opposite of notation that you might see, for instance, in, in USGS uh, river data or something like that. So we just want to keep that in mind. Um, another thing important to note is that when I'm talking about abundances, um, I've only worked so far with 
adult copepod data. We have data for other life stages. I just haven't incorporated it yet. So everything you're seeing is for adult pseudodapinus. Um, so for the abundances for both of these studies, these are, uh, these are plots showing the abundances measured over the course of the 2015 sampling events. And you can see here the start of, of what was primarily observed in both of these studies, which is that the abundances are elevated at night, which again, given that, that dial behavior we're interested in is, is what you might expect. And the signal was even stronger at the, uh, the Wildlands Marsh site um, where the daytime abundances were, were close to zero. Um, and putting that all together, you can see um, again that, that there's, there's elevated nighttime abundances for both studies, both sites, um, but that it's even more pronounced at wildlands. And that could be due to something like, uh, like water clarity or the fact that the, the marsh is shallower and the copepods are, are, are more easily able to drop to the bottom. And then the flow data that we're using to calculate flux is uh, collected by USGS sampling stations. Um, the USGS maintains um, acoustic Doppler current profilers um, at both of these sites that collects tidal or a, a flow data every 15 minutes. Um, so these are just plots showing those, uh, those flow data over, uh, over the course of the three sampling events for 2015. And here again for the 2018 uh, sampling events. Um, notice again, the y-axis is very different here. Flow is much smaller at the Wildlands Marsh. Um, but you can still see a um, full tidal cycle for each of these. So you combine that together to get flux of copepods. Um, and for both of these studies, um, fluxes were, were highly variable. Um, these are what they look like plotted over the course of the sampling events themselves. And when you combine that together, um, there's not really a clear signal in terms of a strong positive or negative flux for either study. Some of the things that you can notice from both of these are that um, daytime fluxes are closer to zero with lower confidence intervals. Nighttime fluxes are all over the place, um, but they're, high, and they're highly variable. So um, this, this raises some questions. Um, namely, how can we scale this up and try to observe some, some longer term patterns? Um, so the USGS flow data that I mentioned um, is available for longer periods than just the sampling events. So the gray bars on these plots represent the sampling events for these two studies. And you can see that the flow data spans a much longer time range. Um, there is some missing ones for that summer of 2015. Um, so we just truncated both summers for the calculations that follow to um, about uh, early June to uh, mid-September. Um, and for the, uh, the flow data for both of these, these studies, um, it's important to note that, that this, this orange on these plots represents just the raw flow. And there's a admittedly very difficult to see blue line that represents the net flow and it's positive for both of these stations, um, which doesn't quite track because it's not as if the cash loop complex is, is filling up with water on the net level over the course of a whole summer. Um, and that points to a limitation that, that I wanna address further on, um, which is that we want to know when water is going in at both of these uh, points, uh, we want to also know where it's coming back out. Um, and that's a limitation with, uh, with, with these fixed stations. Um, but, Using this flow data for the entire summers, um, we now want to figure out we have abundance data only for these sampling events, which are only a few days each of the summers. And so our data sort of look like this, which is where we have, um, you know, we have a flow value for every time point for the summer, but we're missing abundance points. Um, and what Yelton et al. did to account for this was um, basically assigned each abundance point a um, an ID based on the time that that uh, abundance value was collected, a time of day. Um, I, I didn't picture it here, but we used um, solar hour, which is uh, hours before or after the nearest solar midnight. Um, so now each abundance point is related to a specific time of day. You have a summer, uh, summer where each day is broken into those times of day, and then you can randomly resample um, the corresponding abundance points and fill out a hypothetical summer. And you do this a thousand times. Um, and that is how we are able to calculate or estimate fluxes on a longer time scale. Um, so Yelton et al. did this already for their 2018 study. Um, and then I repeated this process for the data from 2015 so that we can see the fluxes at both of these sites um, estimated from the data we have um, for these two summers. And this is what they look like. Um, so this is bad news if you are one of those hungry fish living downstream from either of these sites because these numbers are all positive, uh, which indicates that the fluxes based on the data that we used for this and the methods are, um, are, are going into both of these wetlands. Um, and this raises some further questions um, because again, we're, we're as uh, people interested in wetlands, we're hoping that, uh, that 
that there is an export of, of zooplankton and we're seeing, seeing the opposite results. So, so we would like to further study this question. Um, and this raises, raises further questions. Um, so the first kind of broad category of these questions is, is how this, uh, this copepod um, migration behavior uh, plays a role in all of this. So um, we'd like to further link it to physical parameters. Again, we believe it's driven by light. It's a predator avoidance strategy uh, initially. So it, you know, if you're in the water column and highly visible with a lot of light and very low turbidity, you're visible to predators. Um, whereas if it's very turbid water or there's not a lot of light, you're not visible. Um, but we would like to link this back to physical parameters that, that we have more data for, um, such as again, turbidity or other measures of light attenuation. Um, and then how does this behavior or the degree to which it occurs impact fluxes that we're seeing? So like, again, at Wildlands Marsh, you're seeing a really strong uh, uh, shift between day and night abundances. It's a little bit weaker at a site like Liberty Island. Um, so if you play around with the degree to which this behavior is occurring, is there any scenario under which you're going to see a negative flux or, um, or not? And then how can we scale this sort of question up to the entirety of the cash loop complex and what are the limitations associated with doing that. So the next steps for this um, sort of brought, fall into what I can do for my project, um, my thesis research, and then what is gonna go into a much larger project that is being informed by this work um, funded by, by Prop 1 and being conducted by my advisor and Ed Gross. Um, so for my project, um, I'd like to, as I mentioned, play more around more with those differing day-night abundances um, and sort of use them as proxies for different um, levels of, of vertical migration behavior. Um, and then I would also like to incorporate the, the, uh, the available data for other life stages. Um, the, uh, the younger uh, life stages of this, this copepod um, do not display the same level of migratory behavior. So that could also affect um, sort of the types of fluxes that we're seeing. Um, and then I would also like to utilize um, the abundantly available uh, U.S. Geological Survey data. Uh, Brian Bergamoski mentioned this earlier in his talk that they have gone out and collected this super high resolution data on all sorts of physical parameters in the Delta, including in the cash flu, some of which I've, I've sort of crudely plotted over there. This is turbidity values for October 2018 and 2017. Um, and that could be something that if we can link that to the migratory behavior of these copepods, that would let us get a better uh, look at how this behavior might vary over the entirety of the cash loop complex. And then the Prop 1 study that I mentioned is hoping to take a numerical modeling approach to this question because, um, as I mentioned, with that, uh, those elevated positive flows that we're seeing at those flow stations, um, we're missing some information about where that water ends up going. And, um, and if you use a numerical modeling approach, that will let you see um, uh, in a much more, get a much clearer picture of what's going on in the entirety of the wetland and, um, and where water is moving um, in a much more complete way. And then factoring in these, these behavioral characteristics of the copepods um, to get a more, um, a more detailed picture of, of whether or not this, this entire wetland complex is capable of the export that we're hoping for. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to acknowledge everyone in, in my lab at San Francisco State University, um, particularly uh, Ann Slaughter and Tony Gnafo, who did a lot of the, the heavy work for the 2015 study. Uh, Rowan Yelton, who is another uh, CF, SFSU alumni, um, whose work I have built tremendously upon and has been very helpful. Uh, my graduate committee and fellow graduate students. Um, of course, it's my master's research. So I have to thank the personal people in my life who have to hear about it all the time. Um, and then data sources. Again, I mentioned I've used USGS um, title data and I plan to use further U.S. Geological Survey data. Um, I've mentioned the Environmental Data Initiative here. What I should have said is that this is zooplankton data that has been uploaded to the Environmental Data Initiative by people like Sam Bashevkin and others. Um, another shout out to the Zuper tool, incredibly useful, highly recommend it. Um, and then my master's research has been funded by the National Science Foundation and the aforementioned Prop 1 grant um, from uh, Wim Kimmer and Ed Gross. Uh, with that, Thanks very much, everybody, for listening. And the first time, I'll take some questions. Okay, we have a couple minutes for questions. Denise has one. Um, first of all, excellent work. I love these studies, and I just find it fascinating how you incorporate the behavior of the zooplankton and the tidal flux and compare them across sites. Um, a couple of times during the talk, you mentioned that 
maybe you were disappointed that you weren't seeing outwelling of these zooplankton into the deeper channels. And I completely understand that because it would be great if there was a net export of zooplankton. But just coming from a fish perspective, it doesn't seem that unfortunate that marshes would be a great place to be a small fish that you could move into and eat while not being eaten. So in my view, I just wanted to share that it's not necessarily unfortunate. It's just, uh, it's a nice little place to grow and hide and feed. So. Yes, yeah, thank you. And, and that's a really good point. Um, you know, I think think the, the idea that we would be disappointed is a bit of excessive narrativization on my part. Uh, I think it's, we're we're here to learn what the marsh is doing, and um, and the cash flow complex is is excellent habitat for for fish like delta smelt. So so it's not as if the entire question of the value of wetlands rests on whether they can flush zooplankton downstream, but it's just a dynamic that we want to pin down. Um, I was interested along the same lines about that. Um, you know, the depletion on site, and one of the things I was wondering is, I'm sorry, I don't know where you are. Oh, sorry, over here. Okay, cool. Thank you. <laughs> um, what I was wondering is, did you notice any association between um, uh, high water events where they overtop the emergent marsh plane and potentially those invertebrates are getting caught up in the marsh on the uh, ebb tide? Uh, that's a really interesting question, uh, which is a, a true comment and also because I'm buying myself time because it's a hard question. Um, and um, I mean, the short answer would be I, I'm not sure. And I think it's a really interesting dynamic that would be that would be good to explore. Um, I am. I, yeah, I'm not entirely sure if there's at either of these sites you're seeing um, zooplankton get caught and then wash back out. Um, and because I'm repurposing again work that other people have done, um, and I'm not as I've been to the Wildlands Field site myself once on another project, um, and I've seen the Cash Slough site in the distance. Um, but um, I would I would probably feel more comfortable answering that if I had a bit more granular understanding of how both of these sites worked. Um, but I think it's a really interesting question and, and something that would be good to explore further. Thank you. All right, thank you, Charlie. Uh, next up, we have Calvin Lee from ICF telling us about the Directed Outflow Project Lower Trophic Study. All right, hi everyone. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Calvin Lee. I'm a senior biologist with ICF and I'm here today to talk to you about our work on the Directed Outflow Project, uh, the Lower Trophic Study. Uh, just some quick background, as we all know, uh, delta smelt spawn in freshwater regions in uh, the winter. The larvae hatch out in these regions in the spring, and a portion of them migrate down into the low salinity zone during the summer and fall season. Uh, in the low salinity zone in the fall, they'll mature, grow, and eventually they'll head back up to freshwater regions again. Uh, the fall period is particularly important because this is when delta smelts are growing, they're putting on weight, they're maturing uh, right before they you know, go up to spawn again. Um, higher food availability during this fall season is correlated with higher increased pre-spawning survival. So uh, like I mentioned earlier, in fall, delta smelts are found in the low salinity zone. And as part of efforts to protect delta smelt populations and enhance them, uh, during wet years, the fall X2 action occurs. The point of this action is to release water downstream to push the position of X2 further seaward. Um, so uh, during dry years, um, X2 is around 81 or so, and the outflow action pushes that further uh, seaward. And what that does is it moves that low salinity zone further out west uh, into different, providing more habitat and prey resources for delta smelt, hypothesized at least. Um, by doing this, um, it's, you know, it's hypothesized to change in number of abiotic and biotic variables that in theory benefit delta smelt. Uh, for example, lower water temperature, higher turbidity, increased prey density. Um, our study was focused on asking if these benefits were true or real and uh, evaluating if there was more food available for delta smelt as a result of the X2 action. Uh, delta smelt eat all sorts of zooplankton, uh, but research has shown there's one species in particular they really like, uh, or that's found most often in their stomach, uh, Pseudoptimus forbici. 
uh, just to give you an idea of how small these little zooplankton are. A uh, picture on the left here shows an adult delta smelt at the top. Uh, just below that is a larval delta smelt. Below that is a mycid shrimp. And that little pink dot you see there, that is an adult pseudodaptimus forbici. Uh, each little square you see on this microscope slide is one millimeter by one millimeter. And the picture on the right gives us a zoomed in look at uh, an adult female on the far right there. That's about the size that you'll see at that little pink dot. So you imagine uh, a delta smelt has to eat a lot of these little things in order to grow, survive, and reproduce eventually. So we were tasked with helping to answer the following question. Um, how does the fall X2 action enhance delta smelt habitat? Most of our work focuses on the question if there's more food available for delta smelt as a result of this action. So how do we go about answering this question? So we conducted a paired survey with the Enhanced Delta Smelt Monitoring Program run by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, you can see the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service conducting their fish toes in the back here. And meanwhile, we just followed behind them collecting habitat data. Uh, we began this study back in 2017 during a particularly wet year, and we sampled every other week during that fall. In 2018, we again sampled in the fall, but went out every week. And starting in 2019, we sampled uh, beginning in April, covering late spring, summer, and fall seasons. Uh, we sampled five different regions every week with Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, within each region, we'll sample three sites that are randomly generated and change every week so that we get a broad spatial coverage of the entire region. At each site, we'll sample three different habitat types, uh, a shoal, which is uh, at water depth of less than 10 feet. And then we'll go a little deeper into the channel and we'll uh, sample the surfaces of that. And if the channel is deep enough, so greater than 20 feet, we'll tow uh, in the lower half to one third of the water column, uh, collecting any of the zooplankton there. So we'll tow two, two different types of nets. We tow a larger mesh size mycid amphipod net and a smaller mesh size mesozooplankton net. Uh, at each site, we'll, we'll conduct our zooplankton tows, but we'll also take data on uh, environmental qualities such as temperature, pH, so on and so on. And uh, we've also done a bit of work looking at the phytoplankton resources. So we'll take a phytoplankton sample, we'll take water samples for nutrients, and then we'll take a fluorometric chlorophyll A uh, sample as well too. So at each site, we'll collect a sample, we'll bring it back in the lab, we'll dye them pink so that they're easier to identify, and then we'll process the sample. So we follow the same protocol as the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. We try to ID everything down to the species level, and then from there, we'll calculate abundance and biomass. So just to give you a quick idea of how much work has gone into this, uh, we've paired up with the EDSM for over 2,600 sites. Uh, we've done more than 6,000 zooplankton tows. We've collected more than 12,000 individual jars of samples. And we've counted somewhere around 7 million organisms. It's a lot of time out in the field. We've had collected data. So what have we learned? Um, it's just a small piece of what we've learned. Uh, one of the manuscripts we've submitted recently uh, focuses on this particular question. Does the X2 action enhance delta smelt habitat? Uh, we did address some of the abiotic hypotheses surrounding the X2 action, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to be focusing on the food part of the question. So we used data from four years of sampling during the fall, two uh, when the action took place, and two when the action did not take place. Uh, this figure here shows the position of X2 from the summer to the start of winter from 2017 to 2020. The blue lines represent the wet and above normal precipitation years of 2017 and 2019 when the action did take place, while the red and orange lines represent drier years of 2018 and 2020. We see that X2 increases, meaning, meaning uh, moves further landward from June to August. However, in wet years, these blue lines starting in August through November, X2 decreases again uh, towards that targeted 74 kilometers that I mentioned earlier. To drive, this, to drive home this point even further, uh, we're now looking at outflow at Chips Island for summer through fall months, again for 2017 through 2020. We see that uh, outflow during the wet years decreases from June to July to a point that it's comparable to outflow during the dry year of 2018 in the yellow there. However, unlike the years where the action didn't take place, outflow increases again through the fall months. 
Uh, what I'm trying to demonstrate here is that the position of X2 during the fall period wasn't due to wetter, con wetter conditions earlier in that year, rather due to the water releases and the action. So moving on into the zo uh, zooplankton, uh, we plotted the abundance and biomass of all the zooplankton samples taken during the action and non-action years, which we renamed uh, augmented and non-augmented flow. Uh, this is gonna be for the next few figures. This was for the manuscript. Uh, these box plots represent the median zooplankton abundance and biomass in each region. And what we found is that the abundance of zooplankton was higher in Sassoon Bay uh, during action years. This is highlighted by this blue box here. Um, however, when we looked at the biomass, it did not significantly change in Sassoon Bay. Uh, we believe this was due to the different zooplankton community uh, during non-action years. Uh, I'll be returning to this point a few slides later to further elaborate that. So at a broad level, we found that abundance was higher during the action years, but biomass was not significantly different. So we zoomed in even further and took a look at the uh, zooplankton communities. Here we have an NMDS plot. Basically, each polygon you see here is a graphical representation of the zooplankton community found in that region. If the polygons overlap with each other, it means that they're similar, but if they don't, it indicates the zooplankton communities are different. I've highlighted Zasoon Bay here in the magenta polygon, and you can see during the action year, it overlaps with most of the landward fresher water regions, and during non-action years, it's different from the more landward regions. Uh, what we're showing here uh, during the action years, uh, the zooplankton community in Sassoon Bay is more similar to these fresher water regions. Uh, so zooming again even further, uh, we took a look at which species were driving the difference. Oh, sorry, I forgot to mention. What's driving the differences is salinity, which should not be surprising given the talks that we had yesterday, uh, but that was the main driver. Uh, zooming in even further, we looked at which species were driving the differences between action and non-action years. Uh, the main one was Pseudodaptimus. Uh, we see during action years in Sassoon Bay, there's a lot more compared to non-action years. You can see the portion of the total abundance is lower during non-action years. So this might suggest that Pseudodaptimus is a freshwater species. However, in lab and field studies, they're more of a brackish water species. So why does it appear that they're only found in freshwater regions or when there is an action? Well, that's because some of the uh, major predators and competitors of Pseudodaptimus are in the low salinity zone in Sassoon Bay. Uh, this includes Potama corbula, the overbite clam, and also uh, Acrochiella sinensis, another predatory zooplankton. Uh, one researcher noted that mortality in Sassoon Bay is so high that if it weren't for subsidies of Pseudodaptimus coming from more abundant regions, there would be virtually no Pseudodaptimus, which is what we see during the non-action years. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the major competitors and predators of Pseudodaptimus is uh, Acrochiella sinensis. Uh, during non-action years, we see the abundance of biomass is slightly higher in Sassoon Bay, and we see fewer pseudodaptimus in the region as well, too. So um, the action can change the range of a species or move it around due to the salinity tolerances, which can change trophic relationships in that region. Uh, for example, there was most likely less predation on pseudodaptimus in Sassoon Bay during action years, and during non-action years, we probably saw more predation in um, the uh, lower Sacramento River uh, feeding on Pseudodaptimus there. Uh, before I move on, I just want to move on. I just want to revisit a point I made earlier about how we didn't see a difference in biomass between action and non-action years. Uh, we believe this was due to a species of zooplankton, uh, Tortanus deshrilobatus. It accounts for a small portion of the abundance, but uh, accounts for a larger portion of the biomass. Uh, to summarize, we found more pseudodaptimus in Susun Bay and fewer of its predators. Um, yeah, so. Uh, given that we know the flow action can move pseudodaptimus from high abundance regions into the low salinity zone, we asked if we were to use the flow action to move X2 further westward, how many pseudodaptimus would be moved into the low salinity zone? Uh, to answer this question, uh, instead of looking at different regions, we took a box model approach. We divided the Bay Delta into different salinity boxes. This map comes from a previous paper that one of our collaborators published back in 2019, also using a box model approach. You can see the, th the thick 
black lines to note different boxes. Uh, we have a Sacramento River box, San Joaquin River box, a very low salinity zone box, a low salinity box, and a high salinity zone box. The map on the top shows, uh, based on hydrological modeling, where the various salinity boxes would be if X2 was at 79 kilometers. And the map on the bottom shows that uh, where the boxes would be if X2 was at 67. So you see that low salinity LS box is shifted further uh, seaward. So here we're showing the proportional exchange based on the modeling results. Uh, what we have here is the source box. You can see the source box at the top there. And we look at the proportion of particles that move out of that box into which salinity box they end up in based on different X2 scenarios. So for example, let's look at the San Joaquin River box, that SJ box up at the top uh, left there. We can see most of the particles that started there ended up staying there. That's indicated by this blue color, which you can see in the destination box legend on the bottom right there. Uh, what we found is that there isn't much exchange between the source boxes for pseudoaptimus. Rather, most of the organisms or particles kind of stayed in their own box, with the exception of the very low salinity zone. There was higher exchange into the low salinity zone box. So even though there isn't a high amount of exchange between some of the boxes, the amount of pseudos that get moved into another box can be quite significant. Uh, this is because there's really high abundances of pseudos in some of those source boxes. Um, here's kind of a simplified example of how this kind of all works. We have two different pitchers with uh, one with high density of pseudos and one with low. Uh, what happens is the X2 action moves a small portion of these pseudos into a lower abundance box. And essentially what we've done is we've tripled the amount of pseudos in this uh, low slin or this low abundance box. I also want to note that the high abundance uh, pitcher or box, it kind of refills itself because there are so many adults in there that they re, uh, procreate and they make babies and then we have uh, more adults again. So it's a simple example, but when you scale it up to the thousands, the effect can be significant. Uh, here we're looking at uh, survey data that from the study that we conducted and you can see uh, in the low salinity zone box, uh, very low counts, but in some of these other source boxes, such as the San Joaquin, very low salinity box and Sacramento River box, uh, we had counts that were in the thousands compared to what was in the low salinity box. So based on the movements of pseudodaptimus at different X2 scenarios, we see that at its X2 moves further out west, the subsidy and net gain to the low salinity box increases. However, we do acknowledge that moving X2 to 67 kilometers is very, very expensive and not very practical. So key takeaways, subsidies at high flows provide a large contribution in proportion to the low abundance in the receiving environment. Um, I just want to end by giving a quick plug. All our data from the DOP is available on EDI and has been integrated into Zoper. Thanks again, Sam, for all your hard work on that. It's, it's a huge data set to work with, so appreciate all your efforts. Um, and with that, I'd like to acknowledge our funders and collaborators, including uh, U.S. Borough Reclamation, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Also, thanks to UC Davis for helping run our nutrient samples and finding the team at ICF. Uh, it took a lot of folks out there doing the field work, managing the data, performing all these analyses, and uh, I'm really lucky to work with all these people. And with that, I will take questions. Do we have any questions? I'm okay with that too. I just have a quick question about the biomass measurements. Are those um, are those weighed directly, or is that inferred from an equation? Or it's in, it's inferred from. Uh, previous measurements that other other labs have done. Yeah. Okay, is that is it um, taxon specific or is it kind of an average across different, you know, it's large groups? Taxon specific for species and also life stage as well. So, okay, yeah, gotcha. thanks. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question? Is that cheating? 
Um, so one of the reasons why you said that pseudodiapsmus isn't um, around as much in Sassoon, I believe, during non-action years is because of predators and then moving in. I'm wondering, given the work that um, Arthur and a couple of others have done with the drought mast, if that's mostly due to like maybe like the salinity tolerances, because we, sh we showed that like Limno has a ridiculous amount of increase during dry years in Sassoon Bay and Sassoon Marsh. And so I'm just kind of wondering if that's like what you think about that. Yeah, I mean, um, so we did have some Limno data in here, uh, but, you know, collected with a CD net, uh, as your work has shown, you know, uh, CDFW has shown that there are biases in that. Um, so that's why I kind of stayed away from talking about Limno. Um, especially 2017 was for some reason like a bumper crop year and we got those in the thousands, um, but they didn't show up in our nets in quite the same way in 2019. So I don't know what's going on there. Zopes are weird as Rosemary likes to say. Um, yes, uh, salinity is a key part of this. Uh, something I wish that we had a little bit better data on was actually the effect of the overbite clam. That's something we didn't sample directly for. I know other folks have. That'd be cool to kind of see if we can integrate some of that into this, but they do have a really high clearance rate on the uh, nauplii of pseudodaptimus in addition to the food that the uh, pseudos eat. I hope I answered your question, kind of, sort of, hopefully. Yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. Do you have... Do you have any sense that springtime conditions uh, are are how tightly they're connected with the abundance to be exported in the in the fall? Um, we haven't explored the spring data as much. Um, the main goal was to first look at the fall action. Um, I know there is higher phyto abundance in the spring, so um, we would expect to see higher abundances of pseudos not right at spring, but there's a little bit of lag time uh, for that. So in the summer, I believe there is data out there showing that that's when pseudos are the highest. Um, yeah, did I answer your question? <laughs> I'm just kind of rambly. <laughs> okay, yeah, love to talk more afterwards. Oh, out of time? Yeah. Okay, all right, thank you. Great, thank you, Calvin. And last, oops, that's not it. Last, but certainly not least, we have, oops, that's not it either, sorry. Uh, Amy Wong from San Francisco State University, who will be telling us about high throughput sequencing to determine the diets of the copepods, Eurytemera, Caurulea, and Pseudodaptimus forbesi in the San Francisco estuary. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Amy Wong. I'm a master's student at SFSU, and um, I'll be presenting on my project. My advisor is Wim Kimmer, and my committee members are Michelle Youngbluth and Allison Gold as well. And so I'll be taking you through this table of contents. Firstly, my introduction. I wanted to introduce you to my uh, two study species, Eurytemera caroliae and Pseudodaptimus forbesi, which are uh, copepods that live here in the San Francisco estuary. And as um, my two speakers before me mentioned, uh, they are important food species for the delta smell and longfin smell. So something interesting that these two copepod species do is that they fluctuate in abundance over the year. This next graph uh, shows data from the IEP that combines several long-term monitoring zooplankton programs and this is compiled from 1988 all the way to 2020. Uh, as you can see on the bottom axis is the calendar year from January to December. On the Y axis is a log scale of these copepods abundance, the catch per cubic meter. And in the Yuri, oh, sorry, in the blue, we see Yuri Temra, and in the red, we see Pseudoadaptinus. And as many of us know, Yuri seems to be mostly more abundant in the beginning of the year, while pseudo is more abundant in the end of the year. And this project will take a look at the two transition periods highlighted in the black boxes. 
And so the first one being in the spring, we see that Yuri tends to decline in the spring while pseudo rises. And in the fall transition, the second one, we see the opposite happens. Uh, so why is this the case? Very mysterious. And has this always been happening? Well, in this next graph, we see um, all the years split up individually from 1985 all the way to 2020. And we see that this pattern I just showed you has been occurring ever since 1988. But before then, uh, I just showed three examples uh, from 1985 to 1987, uh, but it's been before that too. Yuri was actually abundant year round. And so what happens between 1987 to 1988? Well, we see that the Asian clam or overbite clam, Portomacorbula amaruensis, was introduced to the San Francisco estuary and became abundant in 1987. Pseudo was also introduced to the estuary in 1987. Uh, as Calvin mentioned, we see that the overbite clam had um, a pretty detrimental effect to the phytoplankton population, the food that these copepods eat. Uh, but could these two copepods Pseudo and Yuri be interacting with each other? We think maybe. So, sorry. Uh, this next slide was the slide that I just showed you, but I do want to point out that this is in the low salinity zone from 0 0.5 to 6 on the practical salinity scale. And if we superimpose a graph from freshwater, so from 0 to 0 0.5, where the Asian clam is not present, the same pattern exists. So that this means maybe not just the clam, but also these two copepod species are interacting with each other and causing this, these transitions in abundance. Uh, a caveat to this is that there may be mixing in um, between the freshwater and the low salinity zone, but it uh, gives us reason to investigate this further. So my research question is, why are there transitions in abundance throughout the year? And my hypothesis is that food shortage is driving transitions in abundance. So perhaps if um, we see that these two copepod species overlap a lot in their diet, and as we know, our estuary is very food limited, uh, perhaps they could be competing over this limited amount of food. Um, or if they have maybe not so much overlap in their diets, then we would have to look into other reasons. Perhaps even their food is fluctuating over the year too. So. Uh, I did a field component and a lab component in my methods to answer these questions. And firstly, I'll be talking about my field component. So with this field sampling, I wanted to answer the questions. What do they eat out there in the field um, through these transition periods? And what prey is even available to them? And so I collected in the spring and fall transition in 2021, and I collected two kinds of samples. Firstly, copepods to detect for their dietary DNA. In other words, what do they eat? And I also analyzed for abundance and reproductive rate throughout these transition periods. Uh, the second type of samples were water samples. Uh, so trying to see the environmental DNA. In other words, what kind of prey is even available in the water for these copepods to eat? And I also analyzed these water samples for chlorophyll. Uh, with every time I went out, I also collected for Seki depth, temperature, and salinity. Next is my lab experiment. So I did two, and this is the first that I called the diet comparison experiment. This experiment was to answer the question, what will they eat when they're given the same summer prey assemblage? As we know, Yuri Temra is not really around in the summer, while well, Pseudo seems to thrive. And why could this be the case? My hypothesis is that Yuri Temra, perhaps they eat um, a more limited number of uh, species, but perhaps Pseudo has a more general diet. They're able to eat more things during the summer. But how can we tell if Yuri is just not around in the summer and we can't collect for them? That's why I actually kept alive a population of Yuri until June 2021 uh, so that I can conduct this experiment. And we compared these two species in the same field collected water from June 2021. Uh, here's a diagram of my experimental design. So firstly, we took an initial measurement of the water for the environmental DNA, just to see what prey was out there before we ever did this experiment. 
Then during the experiment, I had four treatments. So the first just being Yuri by itself in bottles of water, uh, this field collected water from June, uh, then pseudo by itself, then a bottle twice as big for both species together, and then a control with no copepods at all. And each treatment had four replicates. And so I incubated these copepods in these bottles for uh, six hours. And afterwards, I preserved the copepods for their dietary DNA and the water for the environmental DNA. Uh, this video is a video taken from my experiment. And we put them all in a temperature controlled room on this uh, wheel that allows the water to um, be properly mixed and uh, suspended so that nothing's settling on the bottom. Uh, my second experiment was a starvation experiment. And this is to answer the question, what is their gut microbiome like with no food? And as we know, even for humans, we have bacteria in our guts that just kind of live there and help us digest things. Um, and that's different than what we actually eat and, you know, pass out. So uh, we want to differentiate uh, the gut microbiome from the actual diet of these copepods. So I starved them for three, six, and 24 hours in these buckets of very, very filtered water so that there would be no food at all. And I placed the copepods inside of these chambers uh, made out of PVC pipes, and they had a mesh on the bottom. And I did this so that when they, um, you know, poop out their fecal pellets, they would settle on the bottom of the bucket so that they wouldn't recapture their food, so they would be properly starved. Yes, I'm very cruel. Um, okay, so I have a lot of copepod samples, a lot of water samples. And how do I tell what's inside of them? We use a method called metabarcoding. This allows for simultaneous identification of many species from a single sample. And so you can use different methods for this, but uh, for this project, we took a look at 16S and 18S rRNA. And if you can see on the upper right-hand side, there's a diagram of the prokaryotic ribosome, um, which the 16S rRNA gene lives within the bottom subunit. And in the eukaryotic ribosome, the 18S is in the bottom subunit. And as an example, I blew up um, the 16S rRNA gene on the bottom, and we can see that it's color coded. So the blue regions are constant regions. This means that amongst all prokaryotes, these regions are the same amongst all their genes. The pink regions are variable. So between prokaryotic species, these regions are different. And that makes it very convenient for us as scientists because we can then design primers that bind to the blue regions, the constant regions, so that we only have to design one primer for all the prokaryotes um, or one primer for all the eukaryotes. And uh, then we can sequence the pink region, so the targeted region that's bracketed. And that region would then act as a kind of barcode that we can then uh, you know, scan against a database and be able to tell what species that was. So this is my workflow for high throughput sequencing. Firstly, I took all my copepod samples and of course, you know, there's a lot of other species in there. So I had to identify for Yuri and Pseudo uh, specifically. Then for all of my water samples, I took them straight from the field to the lab to filter them into these Sterevex capsules and that membrane in the middle would capture all of the DNA material. Then I would extract the copepod DNA or the water DNA. And I would run a lot of PCRs. And this is to amplify the 16S or 18S genes that I was just talking about. And specifically for the copepod samples, I would block the copepod DNA because of course we know that they're copepods. We just wanna find out what's inside of them for their diets. Um, and then I ran a lot of gels to make sure I was amplifying the right thing. Uh, and then after that, I had a huge library of samples and I pulled them all into this tiny little tube that I took to our uh, MySeq machine over on main campus. And this machine is really high tech and cool. It does high throughput sequencing, which is just a term for a novel technology that's able to spit out a lot of sequences in a very short amount of time and in a cost-effective manner. 
And uh, Dr. Sean Youngbluth helped me a lot with the bioinformatics. So turning everything that the machine spit out into actual data. So I did all of this uh, so far for the 18S, again, all of the eukaryotes um, for all of my copepod samples. And I just wanna show you one graph because I, I think I really only have time for one graph, but I think everyone will appreciate it. And this graph is from my diet comparison experiment, which as a reminder, compared the two species when they're incubated in the same water taken from the field in the summer. So here are the results. We see that on the x-axis are the replicates. So again, I had four bottles for every treatment. On the y-axis is the relative read abundance. So this is not necessarily um, quantitative, but more semi-quantitative. So out of all of the reads that I got uh, from high throughput sequencing, uh, each color and the percentage of that color represents the percentage of the reads coming from that particular taxon. And I did this in the phyla level. Uh, if I did any higher, I think the colors would be a lot more. <laughs> but as we can see, uh, Yuri has eaten a lot of euglenozoa, while pseudo tends to have a more varied diet, a lot of different colors, and they're eating a lot of Bacillariophyta. And this is the same whether they're in those individual bottles, just in, within their own species, or uh, in the bottle that contained both species. And to, to tell you a little, a little bit more about the taxa that I just told you about, euglenozoa that we saw in the green that Yuri was eating a lot of, um, if we look at the higher classification, we see that they're flagellates. Uh, while the orange, the Bacillariophyta that Pseudo was eating a lot of are diatoms. Um, and in conclusion, we can see that these two copepod species uh, have very different diets. And this is very interesting because um, these two species, they look alike. I mean, it's really hard to tell them apart, even under the microscope. Uh, they seem to have similar life histories, same body types, like similar looking feeding appendages. But even when put in the same exact conditions, they eat different things. Um, and the same also held true with my field samples, which uh, I didn't have time to show you today, but I'm excited to show you all later when I finish my thesis. So what's next? I need to analyze sequencing data for the 16S, so all of the prokaryotes. So if you're expecting to see some cyanobacteria today, I'm sorry, you'll have to wait. Uh, for And also the 18S and 16S for all of my water samples, the environmental DNA. And I also do want to graph the abundance and the reproductive rate um, throughout uh, each transition period for the species as well. And this is also part of a larger project. Um, so we also did sampling throughout 2022 as well. And if you want to check out more stuff on this work, you can see Anne Slaughter's poster in the poster room. I want to acknowledge my lab, uh, as well as the EO Center and the Weagle Scholarship, ARCS, COAST, and NSF for funding this research. And with that, I would like to take any questions. Do we have any questions? Another methods question. When when you're doing the uh, amplification for 16 and 18s, does it? Do you use different primers, or this are are you able to use the same primers for both, or do you have primers that target them specifically, uh, individually for for the prokaryotes and eukaryotes? Um, I have to remember. I think there were different primers. Am I right, Michelle? Oh, it's just. <laughs> Just kidding, same. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Any more? Oh, Wim, of course, Wim. <laughs> Wim, Wim, can you wait for my question, please? Thank you. I just want you to tell people where you were yesterday. Uh, yes, I was on a flight coming here from Taiwan, so uh, I'm very tired today. <laughs> And still did a fabulous job.
All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone. And thanks so much to our four speakers. They were all fantastic. Um, next up, we have a lunch break from 1230 until 2. So session nine, wetland bugs and fish will be starting at 2 p.m. right back here. Thank you, everyone. Hope we had all had a really good bunch of conversations. Um, I just wanted to remind all of the folks who volunteered to be judges for the Early Career Poster and Presentation Awards. Um, if you have some reason that you can't complete your judging assignment, please let me, Ted Flynn, know. Um, you should have multiple emails from me at this point. Um, and I would just like to remind all of those folks too to please uh get your reviews in soon sooner rather than later if you can get them today or early tomorrow if possible i would really really appreciate it and if you have questions and you're here at the uh at the meeting you can grab me and chat and ask me questions if you need to or send emails so thanks and really appreciate everyone who volunteered thank you All right, thanks, Ted, for uh, getting everyone to sit down and be quiet. I appreciate that. Um, I'm Stacey Sherman with California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and I'm also the chair of the Tidal Wetland Monitoring Project work team. And so the folks you're going to hear from today are part of that work team. And uh, we're going to get started with Gabriel Ng. I'm going to let him introduce himself. And remember, uh, folks in Zoom, we do have someone monitoring the question and answer uh, box. So uh, go ahead and pop your questions in there if you want to. And then folks in the room, please wait until you have the microphone to ask your questions so people on Zoom can hear you. All right. Okay. Uh, afternoon, everyone. Uh, hi, my name is Gabriel. Uh, I'm an environmental scientist with CDFW. Uh, I work in the fish restoration program within the monitoring team. And today I'd like to talk a little bit about environmental drivers and correlates of invertebrate communities in restored tidal wetlands. Now, I don't think I need to tell anyone in this audience why tidal wetlands are important, but they are important habitats for many different fish species, uh, especially out here in California. Uh, they are important nursery habitats for many fish that we are interested in, such as Delta smelt, longfin smelt, and Chinook salmon. Uh, not only are they important nursery habitats, but they also provide food resources for many of these different fish species. But over the past centuries, there have been many anthropogenic impacts on these uh, tidal wetlands. Uh, there have been huge land developments of these tidal wetlands to agricultural uh, farmlands. Um, in addition, we have uh, many introductions of non-Indigenous species, many of which have established themselves in the tidal wetland area. So for instance, we have invasive uh, fish species like uh, largemouth bass and striped bass that are uh, predators on the fish species that we're interested in. There are introductions of uh, invasive clams that could potentially uh, compete with the invertebrates, the zooplankton. There are important food resources for the native fish. And there's also many different aquatic uh, plant species that alter the remaining tidal wetland uh, habitats. And of course, there's always the pervasive impacts of climate change. Uh, droughts are becoming more frequent and more intense. So there are many different stressors that are impacting the tidal wetlands in California. Now, there have been many restoration efforts going on in the uh, North Delta Arc. Here's a map of just some of the restoration projects that are going on. And one of the question is, well, how effective are these restoration efforts? Notably, with all these different anthropogenic impacts within this area, is just restoring tidal wetlands enough to uh, help improve the uh, habitat quality uh, food resources for native fish species? And that's where the team that I work in uh, comes into play, the Fish Restoration Program. Uh, our mission is to defensively evaluate the effectiveness of tidal wetland restoration in the Delta and Sassoon Marsh and how they impact, uh, how they might provide food and habitat for uh, native fish species. 
And so what we do is to monitor these various restoration projects within the North Delta Arc uh, post restoration for up to 10 years. But in addition to that, we're also trying to grab baseline data when feasible, looking at pre restoration data for many of these sites and also look monitor uh, our reference sites to have a good control and adjacent water bodies to see if there are any potential uh, evidence of export of food resources from restored tidal wetlands to the surrounding areas. Uh, our team monitors a wide suite of envir environmental parameters. We have team members that look at the fish communities to see whether they're actually using restored tidal wetlands. We're also looking at water quality and phytoplankton uh, data to see if how the restoration efforts might impact those uh, parameters within the tidal wetlands. Uh, but today I'll be concentrating on the part that I'm working on, which is looking at the invertebrate community within restored tidal wetlands and specifically how they act as a food resource for fish species. And so the question I'm going to try to uh, delve into today is to look at how effective are restoration efforts in making food resources, invertebrates, available to fish in tidal wetlands. And because we know that there are large variability in invertebrate abundance through many different locations, what environmental correlates uh, are there for these invertebrate uh, communities? And can we use that to potentially predict uh, invertebrate abundance in different areas? So just a quick rundown on the uh, field methods to, uh, that we use to sample the invertebrate community. Uh, for each of our study site, we conduct uh, plankton trawls in the water column uh, using three different plankton trawls. We have a macrozooplankton trawl to look at larger invertebrates like amphipods and insects. We also have a Neuston trawl to sample the surface associated community and a mesozooplankton trawl with a smaller mash net to look at uh, smaller invertebrates, what we think of as zooplankton, your copepods, cladocerans. Uh, in addition to the water community, we also conduct sweep nets both in submerged, immersion, floating vegetation to look at the invertebrates that are found within uh, these kinds of habitat. And lastly, we also uh, sample the sediment, the benthic sediment, specifically for clams, because we know that there are potential competitors to uh, zooplankton. And so we conduct petite pornographs and uh, PVC cores to look at uh, those invertebrates. And so for each of our sites, we would go in and collect these suites of different samples at different habitats. And so the, and you guys have seen this map uh, previously, but this is just a sample of all the different locations that we go out to collect uh, data. This is not the uh, full suite of locations that we look at, but it showcased that we collect samples all the way down from Sassoon Marsh uh, up to the Yolo Bypass. And for each of our uh, restoration site that we sample, we also uh, sample a reference site to act as a control and adjacent water body. Now for today's presentation, I will mostly be focusing on these three projects, which is where we have the most extensive data. You can see that they vary across a range of salinity going down from Thule Red, which is our more estuarine site, all the way up to Decker Island. Before I start showing some of the data and uh, our results, I wanna just briefly talk about uh, our analysis and the framework behind that. So for most restoration projects, the idea to show that whether they're effective or not is a before after control uh, impact analysis, a backy framework. And the whole idea behind this is that you are uh, monitoring your restoration site for a response variable, in this case, invertebrate abundance, ideally both pre and post restoration. And hopefully you see in your data that you have an increase in your response variable post restoration as you can see in this conceptual diagram. And if you do see this increase or a change, uh, it does suggest that restoration is, has an effect, but this data in itself is not sufficient to show that restoration is effective because this change could be due to some regional wide effect that is not particularly localized to your restoration site. Instead, what we need is to also monitor the reference site, a control site, uh, both pre and post restoration, but because there's nothing, there's no restoration efforts going on there, uh, it would, should be able to capture regional wide variability. And if you don't see a, a difference between pre and post in your reference site, but you do in your restoration site, you can then, it does, the evidence does suggest that the differences you're seeing in your restoration site is due to the restoration efforts. Statistically speaking, what we're looking for is that two-way interaction between timing and your two different sites. I won't delve into this for this talk, but I'm happy to talk more about it 
uh, later on, but the way we are modeling our data within this BACI framework is using a Bayesian hierarchical analysis uh, with invertebrate cash per unit effort data as our response variable. Uh, our predictors in this is year location and gear type. Uh, and once we have that model, we can output predicted data, which we then use plan contrast to test our hypothesis based on this BACI framework. And just before I, I go straight into the results, here's what the data would look like. Just gonna slowly build up to it. So on the x-axis here, we have years uh, of when we collect data. On the y-axis, we have just the log of our cash per unit effort for the different invertebrates. So this is just one of the output from the model. You can see here, the green dots represent the restoration site. This is just an example of results using our Decker Island project. So Decker Island is our restoration site. And uh, the triangle dots, these are our mesozooplankton, the copepods, clodosterans, uh, abundance. And you can see that there, there isn't much substantial change over the course of their years, especially uh, post uh, through, uh, after the restoration, there wasn't a big shift in zooplankton abundance. And this is our Decker Island project, but we also have data for its adjacent water body and reference sites. Uh, these are two different colors here. Again, they all show similar patterns. And of course, we know that we're not just looking at the zooplankton community, but we also have the other gear types that I've mentioned, just displaying this here right now. That's a lot of data. We're not actually going to go through this, but it just showcases uh, the complexity of, of the model and the data that we're collecting. Uh, and just to add one more layer, this is just one of the many projects that we have going on. This is the Decker Island project. And as I've mentioned, we're, uh, we actually have three different projects where we have somewhat robust data. I, I picked these three out of our uh, many suite of projects because we have good pre-restoration data and some post-restoration data. If you take a look, Decker uh, is our most uh, robust data set. We're three years of post uh, restoration data, but keep in mind that we are, we plan to restore the, uh, we plan to monitor these sites 10 years post restoration. So we're still early on. Um, and when we look at uh, Tully Red and Winter Island, uh, we also have uh, three years of pre restoration data, but just one year of post rest restoration data. So one caveat with the results I'm gonna show you today is that we're still working up the data. Uh, so things might still might still be in flux, but uh, just give you a first glance at some of the results that we're getting. Do note that we have some missing samples in 2020, and that's just the logistics of trying to sample during a pandemic. But again, so that's a lot of uh, data information. And if we go back to what we learned about backy analysis, this is not actually what we're interested in, right? We're interested in do the uh, data points post-restoration, do they meaningfully differ than pre-restoration? And that's what this graph here is showing. Where on the x-axis, we have after minus before your post minus pre uh, invertebrate abundance. And you can see, and again, I'm just showing you the Decker Island just uh, for visual simplicity. So if you look at our restoration site for Decker, we see that, you know, for the Newston community, there was a significant decline post-restoration. Does that mean that restoration wasn't effective in Decker? Well, no, not necessarily, because again, that decrease could be due to something that's impacting the surrounding areas. In fact, when we look at our reference site, WebTrack Island and Burms, we also see a significant decline in the Newston community. So again, this suggests that the changes they were seeing is more impacting in regions than any localized uh, location. And just for completion's sake, I'm going to show you the rest of the different locations here. Um, but and basically, there's a whole bunch of different patterns going on. But what we're interested in is not necessarily the before after for any given location, but how that difference differ from location to location. And that's this uh, figure right here, where now I'm doing location site by site comparison, where we take our uh, restoration site and compare that to the adjacent water body and the reference site. And here, what we do want to see is if there is a significant difference where that difference is doesn't overlap zero, we do we can say there's some difference going on from location to location. But if we look at for most of these sites, uh, they overlap zero, suggesting there wasn't a meaningful change from site to site. I would like to point out that if we look at Ryer versus Gri Grizzly, we do see some significant differences between these two sites. Again, preliminary data, and notably, Tule Red is our restoration site. So what we're actually comparing is 
the reference versus the adjacent water body, but there is a significant difference there. Potentially, this is potentially, uh, the Gri Grizzly Bay is the adjacent water body for Thule. So what we're seeing here is some export from Thule Red, our restoration site, into the surrounding areas, which is why we're seeing this pattern. Again, still a preliminary look. We'll need to dig more into this, but we are seeing some potentially interesting patterns uh, within our study sites. So that's the first question of, you know, are restoration sites effective when it comes to invertebrate abundance? But we also know that there are variation in invertebrate abundance uh, through many different locations over years. And one question I'm interested in is, well, what environmental parameters correlate uh, with, with invertebrate abundance? So what I'm showing here is a conceptual food web model that our collaborators and um, Rosemary Hartman here have uh, created. And I'm here showing, you know, these are the different pathways that can impact uh, zooplankton uh, abundance. And as you can see here, there are many different ecological pathways that could potentially be relevant. You have predation as a top-down effect, uh, bottom-up effects from nutrients going up to phytoplankton that impacts the food resources for zooplankton. Uh, that could be competition uh, with clams where they consume uh, phytoplankton that zooplankton need or actively predating on the zooplankton themselves. So we have all these different hypothetical pathways, and we do have a lot of environmental variables uh, that we collect when we're out in the field. And what I want to do is to determine which of these are important using a backward selection model process. I could have to talk more about that to, uh, to anyone here who's interested afterwards. And I and because our data is still uh, being worked on, and I know that this process is very sensitive to the data it's in, I'm not going to show you the results from that uh, today. Uh, it's something I'm still being worked on. But here's one of the potential models that was selected out of the suite of all of these environmental parameters that shows that chlorophyll, dissolved oxygen, and specific conductance, proxy for salinity, uh, is important in explaining invertebrate abundance. And that can be useful when we look at different sites and see how they relate to these environmental correlates, which can help us predict invertebrate abundance. So I've just shown you guys a lot of data, a lot of figures, and what, what can we get out of it? Um, well, one thing we see is there is no substantial change in invertebrate abundance in our restoration site post-restoration, especially when compared to the reference site. So does that mean that restoration is not successful? You know, I mean, that's no, uh, because for many reasons. Uh, we are, again, are starting with uh, monitoring many of these restoration projects. They've only uh, been restored for one to two years and things could change, likely change over time. And even if we don't see a change, you know, does that mean that it's not successful? Many of these wetlands before they were restored were managed wetlands or muted wetlands where there wasn't a lot of water flow. So through restoration, there is now more access uh, for these fish uh, that use the restore wetlands as a source of uh, invertebrates. And we know from some of our fish sampling uh, that uh, there are native fish within these restored tidal wetlands. And through the second part of my question with the model selection, I hope to be able to identify environmental correlates for these different habitats, which will help us provide a framework to figure out, you know, what makes a habitat a good habitat for invertebrates and does that translate uh, further up to the ecological community. And the next steps that we want to do uh, with this data, we also know that not all invertebrates uh, are the same. We want to look at community composition and how restoration and environmental correlates impact the community composition itself, and also to incorporate biomass uh, into our model. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge our funders uh, from state water contractors at DWR and uh, our collaborators with the Tidal Wetlands uh, Project Work Team and the Data Science Project Work Teams for their feedback on uh, our, our data and the stats that go behind it. And of course, all past and present members of the Fish Restoration Program. Uh, thank you. So we do have time for a couple of questions. Stephanie, are there any on the Zoom? Okay. <laughs> 
So uh, was there any sense of what time scale you should expect um, these changes to occur on? I know like with the marine protected areas, there was modeling done on like how long it would take or they expect it to take for fish populations to come back. I wonder if you have any sense of that for the invertebrate communities in these restoration areas. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And I don't know off the top of my head what we would expect. I mean, zooplankton have a very quick uh, life cycle, but some of the larger changes when it comes to the geomorphology and the nutrients would take longer time. Uh, but that's something we hope to be able to capture with our continuous monitoring. And of following up on that, um, it strikes me that one year later, the restored site is producing as much food as the reference site, most of which are very healthy places. So what are your criteria for, and, and I understand there's, there's a time thing in there, but, but you're seeing already after one year, what I would qualify as, as success, you're saying is not a failure. What are your criteria for success and failure in restoration? Uh that, that's a great question. How, how do we define success? And that is, you know, we do, that isn't potentially ever changing target. One thing to note is our reference site isn't necessarily a pristine site. It is just our control site that we can use to measure as, is there any sort of background thing that we need to take into account for? But you're right. The fact that our uh, restored site is now similar to reference sites where there is open water flow is helpful. And it does, even if it was, the same pre-restoration, our, our restored site. Now that we're giving more access to fish that can use it, that could be one metric of success. So we actually need to move on. <laughs> um, but for those of you on Zoom, Bruce was making the point that Ryer Island is, an, is a nice spot. <laughs> okay, so next up, uh, let's see. Oh, sorry, I didn't. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Brett. I'm Brett. <laughs> um, so luckily I, we are sort of queued up by a couple of talks, but in particular, you heard that um, there was a tidal PAR study. Um, and really the question I really wanna address a little bit in this talk is we're building all sorts of restoration sites, all, you know, tidal restoration sites. Um, and partly that's mitigation um, to help conserve salmon. Um, but we don't really know how salmon use those sites or whether they're going to benefit from those sites. So, uh, let's see, how do I do that? So I just, I'm not going to go through all these names, but there's been a, this is just a, the main people that were involved with this project. Um, there were a lot of people that were involved with this project, you know, who you are and thank you. Um, and also to acknowledge that we had funding from a number of sources, um, in particular, we had a CWW Prop 1 grant, we had a, a grant from, from the Bureau, and we also had um, matching funding help from Metropolitan and DWR. And so when we say tidal PAR, um, just to orient people what we're talking about, um, we're not talking about those big smolty silvery salmon that are coming out. Um, maybe some of the smaller, those salmon in the 55 to 70 millimeter range, but mainly we're talking about fish that are not ready for the ocean. They're still really obligated to, to do some rearing when they appear in estuarine habitat. And that's really what we are interested in for this study. And there's been a, there's been a lot of interest in um, tidal par. They're also, I forgot to mention, they're also called fry migrants is another term that's frequently used for these fish. Um, some of the, if not the earliest um, references to Shunik salmon in the scientific literature going back to 1899, actually made the have made observations of fry migrants, these pre small fish in estuarine habitat, going all the way through time to most recently Mahaj et al. Um, and when they're looking, when they're doing uh, delta smelt and longfin smelt sampling for the um, enhanced delta smelt monitoring 
survey said, we're catching lots of salmon. Someone should look at this and think about it. And it just so happened that we were at the time. Um, but then there's there been this sort of uh, idea through time. And I just wanted to read this quote. It's from um, McFarland, 2021, um, where they looked at apparent growth of salmon that were moving through, um, moving through, and this is in particular through the Sassoon Marsh and Sassoon Bay area said, our data suggests the juvenile should examine derive little benefit from their time spent in the San Francisco estuary. Rearing and rapid growth have been characteristic of northerly stocks during extended periods of estuarine residence, but were not evident in the San Francisco estuary. And I've been told by folks that have worked in the system for a long time that for years, at least up through the um, 2000, early 2000s, any salmon that wasn't in a smolting condition and ready for the ocean that entered that past Ships Island was pretty much considered lost to the population for many years. So, but then we have this situation where in, on the Stanislaus, um, if you look at the gray bars in this graph, that's um, the size range of salmon that are leaving the Stanislaus River. And a bunch of those salmon in some years leave as fry. And presumably some of those salmon don't just rear in the San Joaquin River, but they move down through the Delta and possibly even in beyond. And then if you look at the black bars, some of those salmon come back as adults, but still the question remains, what are the benefits of the population? Um, do salmon, do juvenile salmon really get anything out of estuarine rearing in our marsh or is it really not really a great place for them? Um, and then this, this great paper by Munch et al, they looked at um, naturally produced pre-smolt salmon below 50, 55 millimeters in beach stains at locations through the system on the right indicated by those, those different sampling locations. But in particular, if you look at those two bottom left boxes, um, sorry, the, the axes are really small, but on the, on the y-axis is outflow, 30-day um, mean outflow, and on the x-axis is a proxy for juvenile production. And that white line and the, and the heat map is basically saying, what's the probability that we find salmon in these different areas? So in those bottom two pictures, those are um, those are Thule Red and Wings Landing, and they're showing that really dominant control of pre-small salmon in these areas, the probability of occurrence is outflow with juvenile production also. If you don't, if you don't have salmon, juvenile salmon, you're not gonna see them down there essentially. But when you see them, it's when there's a lot of flow moving them down in there. So we initiated this, um, where's the timer on this other oh, doing pretty well. Um, so we initiated this multi-pronged study. We had a trial survey. We did a parallel eDNA survey at the same sites. We did a cage growth study. Um, and we also coupled this with a tissue stable isotope study. Um, so we had a lot of stuff going on. I'm really only going to talk a little bit about the what we found in the trial survey and some of what we found in the cage growth study, because um, each one of these things could probably, you know, get a full 15 minutes. So I'm, I'm not gonna go deep. Um, and our study area was downstream of the confluence, essentially from Sherman Lake, um, where the San Joaquin and the Sacramento join, downstream through the Sassoon Marsh and Sassoon Bay. And actually we did some sampling down in San Pablo Bay as well. Um, and so just to show, we did, we had, we did some, uh, preliminary trial surveys in 2018, but pr primarily we did, we were, um, out there in 2019 through 2021, um, 2019, which is the upper right quadrant there. This is outflow. There was some, there's a lot of flow in 2019. Um, but then the following two years, there was very little outflow. So we were able to bridge, um, some of the, those hydro, hydrological conditions during our study. And for the trial, trial survey, this, um, this is showing all of the sites that we sampled in blue. The really small dots are the places where we didn't catch any salmon. The, anything that's, that's slightly larger, we caught a salmon. And then the yellow dots are the enhanced delta smelt monitoring catch. Um, we included them in our uh, analysis in order to bolster our data set. Um, and similarly, 
anything that's just a, a dot, which is most of those ones, a small one is no catch. And so really, this is just really briefly from our modeling of catch um, and the probability of detecting salmon down in the marsh. Outflow, just like just what Munch et al found, outflow is really the dominant driver. If you didn't have outflow, it was really difficult to find a salmon until the, um, the hatchery releases <laughs> started sending salmon through the area. And the, similar to Munch as well, um, you tended to find salmon along the main migration corridor. But, um, and, the, and so that's the top left is outflow relationship. The next one down the left is distance from the channel. The other relationships really are things that, is, that are likely correlated in some way with those, um, those, two, very, those two drivers. But then on the bottom right, it, it, the graph kind of might not mean much, but essentially what it's saying is there was an interaction between outflow and the probability of finding fish off the main channel, out in the marshes, out deep in the marsh. And when you had outflow, it just sort of homogenized fish across the system. Another graph I'm not gonna show, we also tended to find smaller fish off channel, which might not be so surprising. The larger fish were mainly moving down the main migration corridor. So just jumping over to the cage study, um, we put a lot of cages out. It was a lot of work. We had, 70, we had 72 cages at 25 different sites over the three years. And then on top of that, we had nine different other cage, more cages that were we used for um, sampling fish weekly to use them as models for our isotope analysis. So we could get an idea of what isotopic signatures of the marsh were. Um, I'm not gonna talk much more about that. It, it, was, it was complicated, that's all I'm gonna say. Isotopic signatures um, essentially were highly variable, changed by spatially and temporally and with outflow. And it's, it was really difficult to nail um, a signature for the marsh. And we're now kicking up some studies in um, collaboration with Stacy's group um, with the Fish Restoration Project to try and continue doing that and see if we can get a better idea so that we can, we can catch a fish Carquinas or wherever, and have an idea from their isoto tissue isotopes where they have been rearing and if it's been in the marsh. But that aside, we had a lot of cages out there it's dispersed all over the place. We even have one out in at Galinas Creek, way out on the um, far western side of San Pablo Bay. And instead of just showing you a bunch of graphs, I'm just going to show this is from the first year the range of sort of growth and ending the end fish sizes that we had in these cages in these different locations. And in particular, on the left side are these monsters that I'd say probably rival the um, growth of fish that we see on floodplains. And this was an Arnold Slough. Um, Denverton Slough, which is in that, the nurse, it's in the nurse slough, Denverton Slough complex, still had fairly good growth, but for the most part in other locations, including um, in First Mallard, um, which is a relic marsh, we, the fish didn't grow much at all or shrank. Um, and, and the number of fish you see for each location also is the fish that made it through that didn't basically starve to death, which was kind of sad. Um, but we started saying like, what was different about Arnold? Why was it so different? And we didn't really see big differences in, in zooplankton. We, we, we were doing throw samples and zooplankton um, count or biomass amongst these sites. And um, so we sort of took a closer look at Arnold and we also looked at, um, and I just wanted to draw your attention. So Arnold is the slough that follows the little, where this is Arnold slough. And it, it snakes around up there on the upper part of the picture. And then there's this huge off channel wetland with unmitig uncontrolled unmitigated exchange flow that goes back and forth with Arnold at various places, but mainly up near the top of it. And we found really similar growth in one of our isotope cages um, at Peyton Slough, which is this sort of magical place for catching Delta smelt, apparently. And similarly, it had this long sort of deep narrow channel that ended at the terminal end with a big wetland. Um, this is actually a copper toxin restoration site, so it's probably not so great for salmon, but, but the fit, they grew really well there. And so we started dubbing these things lollipop locations. And this is and um, this lollipops and lemons is from a poster that we showed at the um, AFES conference back just before COVID thing hit. 
Um, so we decided in the second year, instead of putting fish back in the same locations and having them all starve, we looked for other places that had these lollipop characteristics. Sherman Lake was one of them. It's a big sort of pond, sort of still water area, higher residence time that had a bunch of little channels that were connected to it that all the water went back and forth through. Um, we switched our site at Browns from a place that was more of like a dead end channel to another channel there that was a lollipop. And we also put growth cages in Peyton again. And again, this, so this is 2020, just to show you the biggest fish were in these sort of lollipop places, um, places that were distributed, that were, let's see, subsidized. That's the place that has actually mitigated exchange flow through wetland drains, um, had okay growth, but, um, and even Galena's had some decent growth up there, but again, lollipops were the, were the key. Um, and just, just looking at a few sites where we sampled, where we had cages in in multiple years, just to show that it wasn't necessarily a wet and or, dry, or a dry year thing where we happened to put fish in locations in wet years and they grew better or worse. Um, Arnold had pretty consistently high growth across the years. So did Sherman in the two years we put fish there. And in Brown, you see we when we switched sites, the fish growth changed pretty radically, but then that was like a wet year, dry year shift. So there could be something going on there with flow, outflow conditions in water residence time. And then um, this, this is just a, a basic box, a box plot showing that difference in the, the distribution of growth amongst the fish in these different types of what we're calling hydrotypes. Um, the y-axis is, what is it called? Mass standardized growth. So it's basically percent, it's standardized to a one gram salmon and the percent change in growth per day. But, it's the way that you standardize amongst fish of different size. Um, and you can see that, you know, the lollipops indeed were way up at the top. And um, this, I forgot to put the right figure in here, but the only the only two boxes that didn't have significant differences were the distributary and relic marsh, but everything else, um, the growth was significantly higher moving up toward the left. And I, I'm not gonna talk about the figure down at the right because um, I'm running out of time. So basically what controls estuarine habitat use? It doesn't seem like it's flow mediated habitat quality or even um, potential benefit that salmon can accrue from rearing in the habitat, at least from a growth perspective. Um, so we didn't cover survival, but it really does seem like the habitat's there, the fish just can't get there um, unless there's really, really high flows. Um, and, one of, and one of the key reasons why that, that's probably occurring is that um, as the fish move out, if there's not decent flow, they have to move through the Delta, through the lower Sacramento River. And particularly later in the season, if they move through, you just have, the, you have really poor survival as they, as they tick through there. And most salmon in drier years don't tend to head out of the, to head down into the estuary until later in the um, migration season. There's just either the queues or the, the transport or the, they don't exist. And it's no surprise because um, Jelson in 1982 using uh, just basically doing releases, code bar tag releases, found similar um, results. They found that releases that were made in the estuary had 80 times higher recovery rates in the ocean compared to salmon that were re releases in the river. So there's this major connectivity issue going on, getting from the river down through the, um, through into either into the Delta, but in particular down into the marsh. And so it, um, and oh yeah, I put together this cool little graphic. So, and so just to sort of visualize what this is going on in a dry year, you have fewer salmon that are produced and they're sort of trickling out through the system and they're not really making it into the estuary. But then you have these, these blowout years, which we sort of dubbed snow globe years. That's why I had that little snow globe shape. When the whole system is sort of shaken up and fryer just sort of moved throughout the system, they distribute into these different habitats you know, some of the fish land end up in habitats where they're sucked into the pumps, they or or they don't survive, can't find their way out. But uh, you know, they're gonna they will end up in locations where they they can find this beneficial habitat. We don't really have strong evidence um, beyond that Sturrock paper, which I would say is marginal evidence that that the fish that are rearing there are actually making it back um, in any significant numbers. And that's something I think that bears further study. But um, if we really want to have salmon distributed throughout the system, 
and have that sort of life history diversity that's going to keep these populations resilient, particularly as we have increases in the temperature along these migration corridors that's going to shorten the migration period. It may be that these, these um, marsh habitats become critically important, uh, particularly getting fry and young par down into these areas prior to the, um, the onset of the, of the warmer temperatures along the migration corridors. And so this is just sort of the think talk period and people can kind of chime in at this point, but just thinking about what will that connectivity require? How, I mean, we, we have a drought year, there's not a lot of water to let out to create these sort of blowout flows. What are things that we can do if we really want to distribute fish into these habitats during periods when there's not necessarily the huge amounts of water to do it? We do um, we do uh, flow releases to push smolts out. Um, should we do flow releases early in the year to sort of distribute fry? Should we be releasing hatchery fry at smaller sizes? Um, and to try and get at the question of, even, of whether these fish actually do have a better chance of coming back in drier years, you know, we could do things like paired go to bar tag releases or what they're doing on the American this very year um, is releasing actual very small fry that are too small to tag physically and they're using parental based tagging. So that's pretty much my spiel. Um, Thank you. Oh, and I just, I like this picture because there were so many salmon that were down in the marsh early on in our study that they were um, appearing in like our, this is one that just came up in a, a really short zooplankton throw that we did next to our cage. It was hanging out right next to the cage. We also had salmon that were found on top of the cages when we lift them out of the water to sample, sometimes multiple salmon in the same instance, salmon squeezed into our cages to get in with their coat, their conspecifics, which shows that the juvenile salmon are actually, um, they're keying in on where, where their, coat, their compatriots are and, say, and saying like, well, there's a bunch of fish there. It must be a good place to hang out because they're not dead and they're not leaving. Which is sort of evidence that, you know, presence is a good indication of good habitat. But um, anyway, questions? So thank you, Brett. We're going to have to have people find you during the break. Oh, I'm leaving. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So last speaker in this session is Randy Mager from DWR. Hi, I'm Randy. I like Habitat. Um, so this is a nice room. I still miss a Silomar. How many people miss a Silomar? Yeah, it's a, it was nice. Um, okay, anyway. Here today to talk about a quick uh, pilot study we did out at uh, in Susan Marsh in Means Landing. We just did it in September. It was thrown together right quick and I'll explain why. But it was done by uh, Kramer Fish Sciences who uh, under contract with ICF and funded through the long-term habitat management fund that DWR uh, has. And we basically uh, are just looking at on releases coming out of a managed marsh, do fish show up and what are they doing? So, uh, you know, we all know, yeah, we're dealing with the largest estuary on the west coast of the continents. I just love this picture because it's a lot of coast, you know, and uh, we're working on, we all know it's highly impacted. We're trying to make a lot of intertidal marsh. Uh, we're limited to where we can be. The elevations in this highly subsided area, it's just a ring around the bathtub that we can work with that are at the right elevations. It's a problem, um, but you know, we're dealing with it. Uh, but you know, it's never gonna look like this again. <laughs> you know, not in our lifetimes, not for a couple hundred years. Um, 
but we'll do what we can. Uh, I want to look at the Susan Marsh. It we have had a lot of uh, native fish species out there, uh, a lot of delta smelt. That's where Peter Moyle first started seeing the delta smelt disappearing. Uh, one thing that we have out there is 52,000 acres of managed marsh. Now, it's managed for duck clubs, for ducks, and we've got 100 very independent and different thought thinking uh, duck clubs, but it's there. And some recent research coming out of UCD is indicating that the productivity coming off of those, those marshes can be magnitudes higher than what we're seeing in some of the restored intertidal marshes. And so it begs, what can we do about that? And of course, the Delta Smelt Resiliency Strategy indicated that DWR should start working with SRCD and Fish and Wildlife and coordinate uh, drains and floods of these managed marshes to increase productivity and export of nutrients into the adjacent sloughs. So that sounds like a great idea um, and I applaud it, but it raises a lot more questions than it answers, of course. You know, how the releases from the duck clubs coincide with who's out there and what they need. And when is that? Uh, how long do nutrients last once they're put out in the sloughs? You know, is it a, a long-term grocery store or is it just a quick lunch? Um, what's the best strategy for the, for the clubs to operate under, to, to produce as much as you can? And question is, you know, do fish respond uh, when we release? So, and this is this last question that I wanted to um, answer. And just for quick background here, means landing uh, in the Eastern Susan Marsh, it's 660 odd acres of uh, duck club that was purchased by the department back in 2003. And the idea was put a couple of breaches in it. And at that time it was shallow water habitat back in the cow fed days. And uh, so the idea was it'd be a tidal marsh. Problem was there was three pipelines going through it. They were owned by Chevron, PG&E, and Calpine, and they had surface access uh, easements. They did not want it flooded, and their lawyers are better paid than ours. And so that was the end of that project. So now we're operating it as a test bed uh, to look at different management uh, techniques for one, increasing primary and secondary productivity and export into the, uh, the adjacent uh, Montezuma Slough. So um, one of the issues that we have out there and, and out in Susan Marsh in general is Russian thistle, tumbleweed. It's a nasty, uh, very invasive species taking over things. One of, one of the more cost-effective and impactful ways of controlling it is flooding in the late summer. Flood it up when, they're, when everybody else is all dried out at normal duck club operations. And you know we flood up in late summer, they don't like getting their feet wet and they die. And uh, it, it, it tends to work out pretty well. Now, one of the things we noticed a couple of years ago when we were draining and pumping the, the property out is all of a sudden I've got three boats right by the pump uh, guys fishing, complaining that uh, their arms are hurting from pulling out so many bass. And uh, there was a bunch of river otters bopping around and um, a lot of birds, indicating there was some kind of something going on out there. And okay, food web augmentation is going on. Um, so we wanted to take a quick, take a better look at that. And so, we, uh, here, here's, here's the pump, you can see that. And uh, it's a 20, 24 inch pipe, 50 horsepower electrically driven irrigation pump. It pumps out a lot of water. I wish I could tell you in CFS, but I've never measured it, never calculated, but it's a lot. Um, so I had to flood up again this year because Russian thistle was getting to be another you know, bigger problem that year what we had knocked back a couple of years earlier and run back. And so we wanted to put a study together real quick to see like, 
what's going on out there besides fishermen complaining about their, their catch. And uh, Kramer Fish Sciences has been doing a lot of work for us uh, looking at aquatic response out at the Dutch Slough Tidal Restoration Area and also at some setback levees we've got in the, in the Delta. And it came up with a, you know, Baki design before and after control impact. And we're looking at uh, the gate, which is, uh, we've got 36 inch uh, tidal gate down at the Southern end and at the pump, pump out a lot of water and a control site up by, by nurse Slough. And figuring that's far enough out of the uh, the of the effect of means landing. So uh, you know, we want to do that, and we set it up so that um, hmm, okay, um, we'll do our transects before we pump, and then during while we're pumping, and then of course after uh, utilizing Kramer's um, aquatic habitat sampling platform. It's a uh, pontoon boat with a forward mounted net, funnels uh, organisms down through, they exit out the back, but before they do, they pass through a, a uh, imaging area where they are recorded by high definition cameras. And um, the cool thing about this is that it can move fairly quickly through, through an area. Organisms are not entrained. Well, technically they are, but they go out the back end without uh, being stuck in a cot end and lifted onto a boat and counted and all that sort of stuff. Um, it's the the boat is geolocated, continuously monitoring water water quality parameters, and so we can see exactly where the boat is, what's the water around it like, and who's out there and what's going on. So. Uh, Here's an example of a transect. We'd start about 100 meters outside the plume, going through the plume, and then continuing outside. Uh, we, pump, we, we sampled a week before the pumping, and thrice during the pumping, once a week, and then a week after the pumping. It's pretty straightforward. And we figured we we're going to get some kind of effect. Um, you know, the one on the left is uh, a dream world. Uh, we get a, we get a high effect right right at the site and attenuates as you get further. Um, on the on the right hand side, we're looking at you know kind of what we'd expect uh, if it's augmenting the food chain. We get primary productivity up first, followed by uh, phytoplankton, um, followed by the, your secondary grazer zooplankton, and then later on by your striped bass in red huh, or uh, and then silver sides or something like that. Well, what we found, just look at the results and let's see if this will work. I don't know if it will. Oh, yes, okay. So as the boat's going through the plume, you'll start seeing things going by and sometimes a little red box and that's working, right? Okay, so great. And uh, the, the little red boxes that go by is the AI identifying a fish. And um, so it continues on through the plume things going by and um, you know you can see the fish every now and then identify the fish are identified and what we see here is then the changes in water quality also on the sons that are on the boat and then as it enters into plume into the pink area we see different changes in the water quality you've got temperature at the top do uh, conductivity turbidity and chlorophyll and then as it exits the plume it returns back to normal, uh, what we saw before. Now, um, on the bottom here is the fish detection and the red dots that are at the top of that little rectangle on the bottom, that is where it's identified as five fish or more. And the blue bars are probably one fish and the black bars are, it's something, might be a fish, it's probably debris. But again, you see right when it's going into the plume, that's where, that's where we start seeing the changes. So I thought that was kind of cool. Um, so let's look at the environmental response. And by the way, I mean, this is just looking out above and you can see the plume that's coming off of the, the, the pump. It really does put out a lot of water into the, into the slough. Um, 
Okay, so we definitely saw an environmental response. The orange plots are in uh, orange and the you know, teal, turquoise, blue, whatever is, is the, uh, the, the, the pump, the treatment. And we see here before, before we start pumping, you know, while the control and the pump are different values, they show somewhat the same trends. Uh, and then once we start pumping on the impact, um, on the left is the control. And on the right, you again see where, when the boat goes through the plume, you have changes in the water quality. Uh, the zooplankton fish image analysis, as you see, the AI will show, excuse me, uh, a, a identified fish in red. And the zooplankton imager will um, show when it's unlikely or it's questionable what, what it is, it'll give it a, a blue polygon. And if it identifies in red, it's good likelihood it is a uh, zooplankton. And it, easily identified copepods. And so that's what we went. You can see off on the right, it's kind of a zoomed in uh, figure. Uh, zooplankton response. So looking at that, looking especially at copepods, we see a, it's in blue is the, zo is the uh, is at the pump. Green is at the gate and red is the control site up at, at uh, nurse slew. And the gate and the and the and the control pretty much follow each other during the impact time, the three weeks that we're we're uh, pumping. We got the most response of zooplankton at the very beginning, and then it it dropped off over the three weeks. We pretty much saw the same for the fish response. Here um, is unfortunately mostly inland silverside. Ninety two percent were identified as silverside. So much for native fish. Uh, location, two thirds of them were at the pump, blue line, okay? And then um, the impact was highest at the beginning and dropped off as, as time went by. So in terms of our hypothesis, yeah, the return waters will demonstrate notable effects on slough water quality. No doubt. Uh, the food web change will be detected in Montezuma Slough. Yes, not exactly what we thought. Um, you know, it didn't follow our, you know, the, the, the cool food web curve. curve. Um, instead, we saw very quickly an immediate response by inland silver sides and zooplankton. Chances are the zooplankton was what was being pumped out there from the uh, from the site, uh, the, the, the fact that the uh, silver size showed up right away indicates that it's more of a behavioral response rather than a food web response that we would have expected to come later when you get a nice robust food web out there. So it looks like, yeah, they were, they were somewhere in the channel and they showed up for lunch. We did not see uh, the striped bass fishermen there. Of course, they were complaining about it all, all year. So maybe we weren't having a good year. I don't know. This was, again, just a one-year shot, you know, basically four or five weeks. So um, it's not uh, totally conclusive, of course. We did see the attenuation as time went by that we'd expect. Um, so we've got evidence that, uh, yeah, the flooded, the flooded, the waters off the flooded land did alter, uh, affect slough water quality. The act of pumping showed distinct gradients in turbidity, salinity, temperature, dissolved oxygen. Uh, we did see change in fish density, zooplankton. Fish were dominated by a single species, inland silver sides. Um, guess that's who was in the neighborhood. Uh, and the method for returning the, the water to the slough definitely had an effect. The, the act of pumping, a clear effect. 
the tidal gate, the effect wasn't detectable. Doesn't mean it wasn't happening, um, but it just wasn't as clear an effect of what we're, what we're looking for. Um, so back to sort of the reconciliation ecology and approach to conservation, we killed the Russian thistle, which was the management purpose. You know, but the byproduct of that was the fact that we were introducing nutrient-laden water into the slough. So that was great. Um, we fed a bunch of inland silver side. Yeah, well, and the zooplankton was not as 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 a big a height or change as we expected. Again, uh, there's a lot of things to work out and why and what we can do to, to increase zooplankton uh, productivity. Um, obviously there's complex interactions taking place. We're just getting a glimpse of that. We just wanted to test whether we could do that with, with, with the tech that we had. It's a new boat, we were seeing what it could do. And looks pretty good. It, 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 we can see a lot of uh, very distinct fish behavior and water quality changes. Um, well, again, we did kill the thistle, but we just ended up feeding the uh, the guys. Oh, one of the things that I want to do next year, ideally, if we find funding, is we are we are flooded for the next eighteen months because UCD researchers want to look at changes in in and characterize the production, primary and secondary production within. Uh, areas in the Susan Marsh under different management regimes, intertidal marsh, uh, continually flooded, um, a, a, a muted tidal regime, which is what the, uh, means landing will be. Um, they've got another one in there somewhere, but we're gonna be the muted tidal. We're gonna keep it flooded for the next 18 months and we will be releasing water every now and then into the slough and it'd be really nice to see who shows up. Who's, who, you know, who do we feed? Can we be feeding Delta Smelt? Both of them that are there? I don't know. Um, so anyway, want to thank the, the DWR's Long-Term Habitat Management Funds for letting us do this. Kramer Fish Sciences for doing the heavy lifting. ICF Jones and Stokes for giving us uh, contractual coverage. SRCD, because nothing happens in the marsh without them and they do a great job. Uh, we've got a water manager, George Dana, at Means Landing. He's great. And the UCD researchers out of uh, John Duran's lab, uh, Alice Tung and Kyle Phillips. I want to give them a thanks. And then uh, if you've got time for questions, I don't know. That actually brings us to the break. So you can find Randy and ask him all of your questions. Um, so our break is going to be 20 minutes. Uh, you'll be back here at 340. And the next session is established in new aquatic plant invaders in the Bay Delta. So welcome to the 10th session of the IEP workshop on established and new aquatic invaders in the Bay Delta. Nick Rasmussen and I are going to be moderating this session. 
We co-chair the IEP Aquatic Vegetation Project Work Team, and this session showcases some of the projects that the PWT members have been working on. I'm going to start off the session with updates from our PWT activities over the past year or so. So I'm going to talk about some of the workshops that we ran last year, some publications and data set publications that we brought out. Um, what are some of the field data that are being collected concurrently and may be collected this year? Uh, some of the new and monitoring, uh, new monitoring and control tools that are out there for invasive species and uh, a couple of our ongoing projects. So for the first time uh, this past year on September 20th, uh, we actually did an aquatic vegetation um, ID workshop. And uh, this was uh, in person at Lake Natoma's Inn. And we looked at, we introduced people and taught them to recognize about 40 species of submerged, emergent and um, floating vegetation. And we actually went out into the field the previous day, collected samples of as many of these species as we could find, and we actually taught them to recognize them. Um, we had 29 participants from seven agencies. It's pretty cool. Um, it was a pretty good year for aquatic vegetation related publications, because this year the state of the Bay Delta science um, report was due, and they brought out this series of papers in um, the SPUs um, journal as a special issue, and it was focused on primary producers in the Delta, and one of the major primary producers, of course, being aquatic vegetation. So there was um, papers on um, primary productivity in the Delta, looking at historical, current, and future scenarios. Uh, there, were, uh, there was a paper about the ecology and ecosystem effects of invasives. There was a paper on the history and science of controlling these invasives and also on how to map them using remote sensing. And uh, there was a synthesis paper that Laura Larson put together, which kind of tied all of these things together. And then there was this big study that we had done um, in the early years of the PWT on um, the efficacy of submerged aquatic vegetation control uh, on two separate sites. So we had two control sites and two treated sites in the Delta. And there was a ton of data collected and it was a massive effort. And that paper is now out in estuaries and coals. Um, there was a exploration that I did with three other people, um, Jeremy, Luis, and Ed Gross. Um, on the landscape scale um, efficacy control, again, of submerged aquatic vegetation, but looking at five years of data and across the entire delta, across 130 sites. And this paper is now out in biological invasions. And then uh, Brenda Grevel up at USDA um, also uh, co-authored a paper on salinity and inundation effects on Iris pseudocorus, uh, uh, which is a new invasive in the delta. Uh, data set publications too, um, CSTARS at UC Davis, um, they put um, out two data sets. One is our field data collection that we've been doing there since 2007. This is um, rake data collected for submerged aquatic vegetation uh, in 2007 and eight, and then from 2014 up to today. And this has been posted on EDI. And then there are all of the class maps that we've ever uh, created dating back to 2004, we now have geotiffs of these class maps, annual class maps, um, covering most of the delta, also from 2004 to 2008, and then 2014 to present. And as, as this effort goes on, as long as some or the other agency is ready to fund these things, we will keep putting updated maps on that same website. So we added 2021 this year, and I'm currently working on 2022, so that should also um, go there. Uh, the paper that I just talked about, talked about the Rasmus and Atal 2022 paper on the aquatic vegetation study, that entire data set has also been published on EDI that goes along with that paper. Um, and Nick is actually working on putting together this integrated SAV data set, um, collecting all of the submerged vegetation surveys that have happened in, in the Delta and trying to put them together um, like the efforts that have happened for zooplankton, for example, and the fish data sets. 
So um, this also will be published on EDI. If you're looking for information on any of these, you don't have to go to EDI or KNB. The IEP data page actually does have links to all of these data sets that have been published and will be published. Um, so the integrated SAV data set, I'm going to talk a little more about it because as of now, it includes four data sets um, in it already. Uh, one is the CSTARS data set that I was just talking about, the aquatic vegetation study that I was talking about, that data set. But then also DBW has been collecting um, data in like a grid pattern in Frank's tract since 2014. That's a pretty cool data set that is also going to be in there. And then there is an old, old study that some people might remember, a BAS and SAV study, and uh, Nick has incorporated that data also in there. 600, more than 6,500 6, samples in there, 19 species. So this should be a pretty cool data set to play with. Um, if any of you have more SAV data sets, bring them over. We will add them, and we will try and keep this integrated data set updated with any new data. Um, so some of the upcoming field campaigns that we already know about, we know that DWR has already funded um, the, along with the imagery that they fund to be collected over the Delta, they also have a field campaign that goes with it, that we need to do a good job with the classification. So that will happen this September, and it did happen in 2022. That data is not up there yet, but it will be. And um, and then um, the uh, fish restoration program also does this aerial drone imagery companion surveys of these partner um, sites, restoration sites and complementary sites do that. And um, they do something, I think, similar to, and Stacey can correct me if I'm wrong, but similar to VegCamp. Like it's it's mapped down to the alliance level. So um, that particular um, effort also has been ongoing. And the kind of information that they collect for every point is, you know, apart from location information, their photographs, plant species, percent cover, um, stand size, vegetation height, disturbance, non-native plant cover. So it, it, it's quite a, a good amount of information. Um, some of the new monitoring and control tools that are pretty cool. Um, the Department of Water Resources now actually has a drone imagery unit. I mean, they've had it for a few years, but <laughs> but um, it's being now it's being put to use in a lot of different areas. And um, it has seven pilots, eight UAV instruments, and um, it has both RGB cameras, but it also has multispectral camera that can collect data in the near infrared. And Nick is actually going to give one of the talks to introduce you guys to how this has been used to measure ribbon weed growth. And ribbon weed is this really frightening new submerged invasive in the Delta that has been around since about 2013. Um, and we are also going to have a talk by Madison on the different methods of herbicide control of Phragmites in um, Blackrock and Sassoon. So the Division of Boating and Waterways has also been trying out a few new things. They have these demonstration investigation zones where they test out their uh, new methods. And uh, one of the new herbicides that they're testing out is imazimox, but they're also using it in tank mixtures with herbicides that they were already using. So like glyphosate and uh, diquat. And they're also uh, starting uh, to use some new gear for, uh, for spraying, like, you know, the agricultural drones that defoliate farms and things like that. So they're using that for actually spraying the maps, which is excellent, actually, because honestly, getting on there with the bat is not an easy thing to do anyway in the Delta. Okay, so some of the new tank mixtures that they've tested, so they tested glyphosate along with imazomox, and um, they found that it was the quickest to take effect and the longest lasting. And that is because the effect of these two herbicides is synergistic. Whereas um, with only mazamox, they got effects, uh, it was nearly as effective, but um, slightly less so. And then the glyphosate diquat mix actually did not work as well because diquat can actually impede uptake of glyphosate. So they are antagonistic in that sense. So, um, this is the drone treatment that I was talking about uh, in those demonstration investigation zones. 
And um, you can see that you can actually predefine the path that a drone takes on a mat. And so it goes out there and it sprays the mat, which is super cool. And they also have this, so I think in, in uh, partnership with NASA and using Sentinel-2 multispectral imagery, um, which is providing them with updated maps of floating aquatic vegetation in the Delta, they have been actually looking closely at the sites that they have been treating, what works, what doesn't work. So they have this new um, floating aquatic vegetation mapper or tracker as they call it. And they've been using that to improve their efficacy. So some of the ongoing studies uh, that have been, um, that are right now uh, in, uh, are going on is one of them is this Water Primrose Eco Engineering Project that is funded through a Prop 1 grant. And we have actually two talks in today's session, uh, Bailey and Michael's talk, that will give you a much better introduction of this project. So I'm not going to waste time on it. Um, the other thing that uh, has been going on is that DWR actually funded, so when I was talking about the data set that uh, the classification maps data set that we have published on KNB, uh, it, is, it has a missing period, right? It has 2009 to 2013 when there was no money to take imagery over the Delta, and so it wasn't. And so there is that hole which is keeping us from using this nice long data set to start to see the effects with climate change and you know some of the temperature effects and things like that. So they have funded what we are calling the gap fill project, which is to fill in these years that we have been missing. And we are now, at, uh, most of the data that we are analyzing is all worldview two imagery which is also a pointable satellite, but it's a pointable satellite, which means it doesn't get 100% cover of the globe. And so if it didn't take imagery, it didn't take imagery. It's only by chance if it did take imagery over the Delta in that period, then we have it. So we've actually already completed 2010 and 2011, but 2010, the entire Delta was not imaged. There are gaps in that imagery. And then uh, 2012 and 2013 will be completed. And um, but 2009, we don't have worldview to imagery in 2009. And so that is going to remain our gap, but hopefully we can fill the rest of the years. That's, that's the hope. And this is what, this is the 2011 uh, map. And this is what that looks like. What you see here in dark blue or dark cyan is what the submerged aquatic vegetation are. And light blue is water and there's not much else you can see in there anyway so it's fine but just to show you an example of um, what we are filling in there and that that is basically a synopsis of some of the efforts that the pwt has been involved with over the past years so questions The gap felt part's kind of new for me, even though I work with you. Um, yeah. And it's a problem I was going to bring up in my talk. So this is good to know. But I was curious because it's SAV and FAV. Um, others will see the issue um, with this gap with water primrose in my talk. And I need like to be able to do the marsh right. habitat. And mm -hmm. I don't see it on that. Are you going to fill it with any of the other classes that you did for the hyperspectral? So so the thing is, you know, with Sentinel-2 imagery, Christiana, they showed that you could differentiate between water hyacinth and water primrose. With Worldview 2, you can't. It has even fewer bands. I just don't, we tried. So I just don't have the right bands to be able to separate those two species. So as far as what the methods that we have now, we can get it down to floating aquatic vegetation, submerged aquatic vegetation, and we have mapped riparian as separate for, from emergent, ah, but I don't know how much I would trust that. But yes, at least for floating and submerged, we are fairly confident that it's it's a go. But we won't be able to tell you that, yes, this is Brimrose and that's Hyacinth. We got a question from online. Yeah. Uh, Darcy Austin asked. I can't actually, yeah. Do we know if there are any effects on phytoplankton from the herbicides? That actually is a herbicide experts question, which I'm not. Yeah, it's more of a question for DBW, but I think people have done some laboratory yeah. studies and there have been effects of things like fluoridone, but typically at much higher concentrations than what you actually realize in the system when you're spraying. 
in general, they say that uh, what they have found in the field is that the levels aren't high enough to cause even secondary harm. So, but yeah, if Krista were here, is she? No, okay. <laughs> Any other questions? I think we should probably move on to our next yeah? talk. Okay, cool. Um, All right. Well, next up, we have Madison Thomas from Department of Water Resources with her talk entitled Controlling Invasive Bragmites Australis at a Restoration Site in Sassoon Marsh. Hi, everyone. Thanks for the intro. Um, like Nick said, I'm Madison Thomas. I'm with DWR Saddle Habitat Restoration Section. And I'll be presenting on the Black Lock Restoration Phragmites Control Study. So just a quick background, Black Lock, our study site, was actually the first restoration, tidal restoration project in Sassoon Marsh. It was restored in 2006 by DWR and the Bureau of Reclamation. But following restoration, the site, um, the large majority of the site was colonized by the invasive emergent aquatic plant Phragmites australis, also known as common reed or just Phragmites. And unfortunately, there really aren't any effective control methods permitted by relevant regulatory agencies in Sassoon Marsh to stop Phragmites spread. And it's an issue at a lot of our other restoration sites in Sassoon Marsh. So this study aimed to test potential control methods on a small scale um, with the hope of scaling up sitewide in the future, both at Blacklock and at some of our other restoration sites. So first and foremost, I want to acknowledge this was a really big team effort with lots of folks involved. Um, including our own research team at BWR and UC Davis. I'm definitely just a messenger for a lot of hard work that people have put into this project over the last few years. Um, mostly the former project managers, Krista Hoffman, JT Robinson, and our supervisor, Gina Darren, as well as um, we also got a lot of field and lab support from Soul to Lake Management, the Bright Chem Lab, WEC Lab, and the Sassoon RCD, as well as our stakeholders and managers. Um, in addition, this was a Delta Conservancy Prop 1 grant funded project. It was also funded by the DWR Fish Restoration Program. So why do we need to care about Phragmites? Um, Phragmites is technically native, but it has an invasive Eurasian biotype that grows in really dense stands forming monocultures that are really great at outcompeting many of our native plant species. Um, this can be seen here in these photos. So on the left, you can see there's a native stand of tulies. Um, which have a very upright shape and allow a lot of sunlight to penetrate through to the mud and um, benthic plants below. One of which is circled here, which is a state listed plant species, Mason Ziliopsis. This contrasts to Phragmites, which is in that picture on the right, which has a much leafier shape and tends to shade everything else out. So what we might be seeing here is a stand of Phragmites that is shading out the Mason Ziliopsis, which is also circled below. And Phragmites has also been shown to have negative impacts on fish and wildlife, including things like bird nesting and other systems, and can also impede access to recreation in certain cases. So this map is just to give you a frame of reference for the study location. Um, Black Lock is in the northeast corner of Sassoon Marsh. And although Phragmites has increased by over 300% in cover in 19, since 1999 in Sassoon Marsh, there really aren't any effective control methods permitted by regulatory agencies to stop its spread. So this study aimed to test potential control methods to see which were most effective and also had minimal off-target impacts. And this includes off-target impacts to fish and wildlife and their food web, as well as um, water quality and also non-target plants. Um, we started the study with on the ground in 2019 once um, with the first year of treatments, which concluded in 2021 with the third year of treatments. And we plan to hope to implement site-wide treatment this fall, which would be phased over six years at Black Lock. So the study started, like I said, in 2019, once funding and permits were secured, and we contracted with UC Davis, sold to Lake Management and WEC Labs to implement treatment and monitoring. This map is just to show you the location of all the study plots. And here the color indicates the treatment type, which I'll go into in more detail in just a bit. But this is just to give you an idea of the distribution of the 24 plots across Black Lock, which is a 70 acre site. So in designing the study, it was 
So I'm make sure I didn't forget a slide. Okay. So in designing the study, it was important to um, tailor both the treatment and monitoring to the physiology of the plant. Phragmites is a clonal species, so it has a really extensive underground root and rhizome system. So it was important to make sure that our efficacy monitoring wasn't biased by spread into the plots by um, non-treated plants outside of our application area. So in this picture, you can see a zoomed in treatment plot. The plots were all 10 by 10 meters, but we only focused our efficacy monitoring on the center four by four meters. This was to ensure we had at least a three meter buffer of treated plants around the area that we were collecting data, um, which reduced the potential for non-treated plants to spread into that center, central monitoring area. So for the actual Phragmites treatments, we used two different herbicides, those being glyphosate and amazapir. We also mowed in some of our treatment plots, which was done three to four weeks following herbicide application. And our treatments, we had five different treatments along with the control, which can be seen in these six blocks here. So those treatments consisted of the herbicides alone, then the herbicides in combination as a tank mix, and then herbicides within without mowing. And we replicated all the treatments four times. So four plots per treatment. So we had 24 plots total, including our control plots. And we also did herbicide, all herbicide applications during low tide. So when the mud below the plant was exposed, which can be seen in this picture here, just so that we were not spraying herbicides directly over water. So we also had some fun tools used for this study, um, one of which was a marsh master, which is an aquatic amphibious vehicle. This was used um, to install the plot markers during the first year of treatments in 2019, which is seen in one of those top left photos. We also used this to apply herbicides during that first year of treatments since Phragmites is a very tall plant. Um, and treatments were so effective during that first year that we're, the plots are much more accessible during 2021 and 22. So we were able to apply all herbicide using John boats and backpack sprayers and um, all mowing was done using weed eaters. So we also did various types of monitoring to assess efficacy and potential environmental impacts from our treatments. And this included physical vegetation sampling, water quality sampling, and also frequent monitoring using UAV or drone imagery analysis. And physical vegetation sampling consisted of measuring percent cover, sheet counts, and biomass, among some other parameters in all of our plots each season. And then water quality monitoring was pretty extensive and consisted of uh, measuring herbicide concentrations and other water quality parameters before and after um, application at different time points to comply with our NPDES permit and also to assess any off-target impacts. Then we also did frequent UAV or drone imagery monitoring to assess the efficacy of treatments. DWR has a really great drone team that did all of our drone flights. Um, they used two different drones to collect imagery. The first being um, one to collect RGB imagery and then the other to collect multispectral imagery. And so these images are orthomosaics and it's what we get um, after we stitch together all of the photos from a particular drone flight. And then we analyze these orthomosaics to get NDVI data or the normalized difference vegetation index. And this photo here, <coughs> the um, color indicates the NDVI value. So red is a very high um, NDVI value close to one, which would indicate a very healthy green plant. And then green is kind of counterintuitive, indicates a lower NDVI value close to zero, which would indicate water or bare mud flat. And here we have some of our treatment plots circled, which have a lower NDVI value than the surrounding vegetation, which is good. And it's what we'd expect given that these plots have been treated um, with herbicide and possibly mowing. So here we have some of our efficacy results from our treatments. Um, so just to orient you on the y-axis is the NDVI value. So at the top, close to one would be a very healthy green plant. Then at the bottom, um, closer to zero indicates dead or absent vegetation. And then the time is on the x-axis and color is indica indicates the treatment type. Um, so each data point is the average NDVI value among all of the plots within a treatment type at a given time point. 
So prior to any treatments in fall of 2019 on the far left, we see all our all of our plots have values at about 0.75, which indicates um, that which healthy green plant is which is what we'd expect prior to any treatments. And then following that first treatment event, um, we see in October 2019, which is that <clears throat> black first black vertical line, we see all of our plots go into senescence, which is what we expected since Phragmites is a perennial plant. And then we see um, moving into spring of 2020, our control plot comes out of senescence, but our values in the treatment plots remains low. So we're seeing some efficacy from our treatments. And then following that second treatment event in September 2020, all of our plots once again go into senescence. <clears throat> so this graph includes NDVI data. It's just a continuation into 2021 and 22. So we see our control plot once again come out of senescence in spring of 2021, but our treatment plot NDVI values remain pretty low. So we're still seeing some efficacy. And then we have our final treatment event in fall of 2021, after which all the plots once again go into senescence. And we then see our control plot come out of senescence with higher values. Our treatment plot values remain much lower, but they're still a little bit higher than we expected um, comparing to past seasons. So we knew there was some healthy green vegetation growing in those plots, not a lot, but we NDVI values aren't giving us, obviously they're just telling us about plant health and plant cover. They're not telling us what species are present. So we did some vegetation surveys in our plots last summer to determine what species were causing these slightly higher NDVI values than we expected. So from those surveys, we found native plants growing in almost all of our treatment plots to some extent. Um, this graph shows the average percent cover of native vegetation in red and Phragmites in blue among all of our treatment types. And this is just to give an average idea of percent cover since our sample size is pretty low. And we um, also had a lot of variability among plots, but we see that native vegetation has a higher percent cover in almost all of our treatment types. And we're the reason behind those slightly higher NDVI values than we expected during that last sampling um, season. So an example of this is on the left there, we have some native chilies growing in one of our treatment plots. And these chilies were not there prior to treatments because we had only chosen plots that had all Phragmites covered. So there's definitely been some passive recruitment. This is just another one of the treatment plots with those plot markers under the red arrows. So this plot had a pretty large growth of native tulips in the center. We're definitely excited to see the native recruitment into plots. It's a good indicator for future success of any revegetation efforts or passive recruitment into areas that we previously treated with herbicide. So like I mentioned earlier, we also did some water quality monitoring to assess any environment off-target impacts on water quality um, out of the almost 200 glyphosate samples, we had zero positive detections, which isn't surprising because glyphosate binds very quickly to sediment and this water is very turbid. And then for Amazapir, we had we had 30 detections out of about 210 samples, but um, all samples were orders of magnitude lower than the MPDES monitoring trigger and also lower than toxicity thresholds that we see in literature for resident fish and invertebrate species. So we're pretty confident that Residual herbicide concentrations from our treatments were below um, thresholds of concern for listed species. So because our pilot study showed a significant decrease in Phragmites cover in our treatment plots compared to control plots for, for all treatment types pretty equally, we're confident that sideway treatment will be effective and have minimal off-target impacts. Now that this study is complete, our next step is taking what we learned from this smaller study and applying it on a site-wide scale at Black Lock. So that's what we're currently planning for. Um, we're planning to split the site into three different treatment sections and also phase our treatments over six years to reduce any environmental impacts and also make treatments a little bit more feasible. And then we'll probably start some revegetation efforts after three years of treatments. That's all I have prepared for today, but thank you all for listening and happy to take any questions if there's time. <laughs> We have time for one question, maybe. Okay. Any Zoom questions? Okay. Okay.
So I'm ignorant. What were, why were uh, the, why were you restricted from using uh, herbicides on the site before? And were they, I'm sorry, just I'll leave it there. What, what were the concerns that were restricting you from using the herbicides before? Um, yeah, that would be any impacts to like listed fish species in the water. Um, we also did some mowing and obviously there's some concerns there with salt marsh harvest mouse in Sassoon Marsh. So toxicity concerns to fish, listed fish species in the marsh. So this study was to show that our impacts were below thresholds of concern compared to like values in literature that we find for cool. what concentrations okay. they would be affected at. I, I misunderstood your initial comments. Great, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Next up, we have Bailey Morrison from UC Merced with her talk entitled Ecosystem Engineering Impacts of Water Primrose in the Delta. The first in our two part series on Primrose. Hi everyone. So I'm giving some updates about our Water Primrose project. That is a CDFW Prop 1 funded project. And it's a big collaborative group of people from UC Merced, UC Santa Cruz, um, CDFW and USGS as well. Um, and we're basically trying to find any information and answers as to why Water Primrose is starting to spread into terrestrial emergent marshes right now. So this project started basically because in 2018, Dr. Shruti Khanna um, posted, or not posted, but published some results on water primrose that basically verified some of what she was seeing out in the field, which is that water primrose, where it has historically grown along marsh edges, has started showing up inside of actual marsh habitat now. And so since 2004, we've seen a fourfold increase in the actual amount of water primrose, and it's been growing more and more since 2016. And I put a little rat up there because I like to refer to it as a rat or a cockroach of the Delta. Um, and so basically what she went through, she did a spread direction analysis and found that, like I said, historically water primrose has been along this aquatic uh, habitat on the edge of marshes. And this is where it grows and grows and grows up until a point to where it's too deep. And once it fully exhausts this aquatic habitat, it appears to have the ability to do a complete 180 and is now going the opposite direction into marshes. And we do not really know why or how. Uh, this is an example in the real world at Rhode Island where you can see in 2008, the interior of this space is largely empty, but by 2021, it is almost completely filled. There are some water hyacinth and other species in there, but predominantly most of that green is water primrose. And it's also up along the edges of that. It's not really a levee, but higher area. And so this has some really important ecological and management implications. So there's textbooks full of all the type of ecological issues you can have with invasive species. But what we're kind of worried about is if water primrose is growing into this emergent marsh, it could be out competing species like tule and cattail and others. It could be altering community composition, successional pathways, along with much more. But in terms of managing this invasive species, um, having water primrose start growing inside of marshes could jeopardize the success of our restoration projects. And it could make it much higher to uh, reach our co-equal goals, but also other newer projects or initiatives like 30 by 30. Uh, there's an additional issue I've been concerned about, which is right now we're largely controlling water primrose by spraying herbicides out in that aquatic area. But if it's starting to grow inside, how do we control that? We don't necessarily know the effects of herbicides on a full marsh community and everything inside there. A lot of work's been predominantly done on fish and wildlife and those types of effects. 
So for this project, what we're trying to look into or what we're trying to answer is what are the mechanisms and drivers of water primrose invasion and uh, how much marsh we could end up losing. And so we've been collecting, we had three different field campaigns and collected a lot of samples and data related to plant traits. We've done imaging spectroscopy in labs. We've collected UAV drone imagery. Um, we're also gonna be doing some environmental DNA to try doing some uh, biodiversity uh, information and use all this to basically try and quantify the uh, amount of water primrose spread as well as the amount of marsh loss and then also try and do trajectories to the future so we can have an idea of where we should be focusing in the delta to try and help control or minimize uh, negative impacts. And then at the end we're hoping to identify and actually map out uh, the marshes that are going to be most vulnerable to water primrose invasion and also hopefully put a value as to how um, ecologically valuable one of these marshes can be individually. And so last year we presented some results about plant traits and imaging spectroscopy, which I'll have a summary slide in a minute just to remind uh, about those results. And then the rest of my talk is going to be focusing on some of our remote sensing analyses related to water primrose. And then directly after this, Michael Gross is going to be going into our uh, allelopathic chemistry <laughs> study that we've also been including in this. Uh, so last year, the there were many results we presented, but the biggest thing from what we collected in the field that we are seeing is the water primrose that grows in that kind of terrestrial part of the emergent marshes is significantly taller than what's growing in the aquatic area. I'm talking like 10 plus feet compared to a couple of feet. And we believe the reason why it's getting taller is it is you have a lot of tule and cattail up along the edge. And so it's basically needing to compete with these native species to get light. There may be some other explanations as well. We're not necessarily digging into what those are exactly yet, but that's where we're starting. And then we have brand new results that we just got a couple of weeks ago. We collected tissue sample from every plant um, that we collected and sent those in to have them genetically sequenced because water primrose is, there's multiple species in the Delta and they're very hard to tell apart. Um, by your eye and have verified that they're all the exact same species. We're not dealing with peploides, for example. All of ours was Ludwigia hexpetala, which is pointing to this, this height difference is phenotypic variation, not two different species. Um, okay, so on to some of the newer stuff. Another question that we're looking into in this project is what's the effect of community structure or marsh structure on water primrose invasion success and the occurrence of marsh loss. So we have two hypotheses for this question. One is related to persistence. So the longer that water primrose is able to persist in the same place or the marsh, the more likely it's going to be able to invade and the more marsh loss we're going to end up seeing. The second one has to do with more of the shape complexity of a marsh. So the more edge you have compared to the like core interior of a marsh, the higher likelihood you're gonna have of that marsh being invaded and obviously higher marsh you're going to lose. So, and that is related to the more edge you have since water primrose initially invades along this aquatic edge, um, it provides more opportunity for it to actually be introduced there. Okay. And so to do an analysis to look into this, we're utilizing the data set that Shuti Khanna introduced earlier. It's the airborne, uh, hyperspectral imagery that they have from 2004 to 2008 and 2014 to 2020. Oh, we went up to 2020, 2021 is now available. And this ranges from about 1.7 to three meter resolution. So it's pretty fine. And it's a really great data set. Um, she has then taken that and used, um, she modeled basically and reclassified each pixel to the type of either land or vegetation type. And I'm able to take those and calculate water persistence at a pixel level or water persistence, water primrose persistence at the pixel level. And I'm also able to uh, figure out where all the marshes are throughout the Delta and then use frag stats to figure out where each individual marsh patch exists also throughout the Delta. Um, and then calculate some of these statistics like para the perimeter to area ratio 
and perimeter and a few other things. So we threw that data into a model and basically found that we are seeing that if you have water permos persisting in a marsh for a long time, or it has it's a marsh that's more complex, so it has more perimeter to area, it's going to have more water permos that has already started invading and replacing the marsh. Um, we did this for two the two different eras because we can't calculate persistence when you have data missing from 2009 to 2013, obviously. And for both time periods, this held true for uh, both of these predictors. The interesting thing was that in 2004 to 2008, we're seeing that uh, Paris of so the perimeter area ratio was a little bit more important of a predictor, even though both were significant. And then the 2014 to 2020 era, we're seeing that persistence was a bigger player. And so we also did a change detection analysis using the same airborne imagery. And just to explain in case people haven't seen a Sankey diagram before, what you're seeing at the very top is the different years of this analysis. Um, we have four classes in this. So we have marsh, water primrose, water hyacinth, but those are the two invasives. And then we also are two invasive floating aquatic species. And then we also have pennywort, which is a native um, aquatic floating species. The, if you look at the length, does this have a pointer? I don't know how the pointer was done earlier, but if you look at the length over on the right side, that's like the relative abundance of each of these classes. And then in the very bottom right corner, you'll see the actual flow. So if you look at the orange area water permeals, you'll see a chunk that moves up to the blue, which is how many pixels changed to March in 2020 compared to 2019, or how many stayed water perm rows or how many in 2019 moved to water hyacinth. So we're able to kind of keep track of the changes of how water primrose has spread or moved and changed amongst all these classes over time. And so what we see in the 2004 to 2008 period is that marsh basically didn't lose any habitat. It was pretty negligible. Both water primrose and water hyacinth um, decreased somewhat. So they're not really stable. And then pennywort, that native species actually increased somewhat and was doing relatively well. Uh, I have a hypothesis that we'll see in a second that water primrose may actually be a sleeper species, which is a theory in invasion ecology, where basically you have a non-native species that's been introduced, but it's not really doing too much until some environmental change occurs and it explodes, it booms. And so when we look at this gap of data that we're missing from 2009 to 2013, we can at least look from 2008 to 2014, and we see that Marsh did increase somewhat. Um, this is not an increase from restoration projects, I have to point out. Um, but water primrose also boomed. It had a 424% increase in this five-year period. We don't know why, because we don't have those individual years that we're missing. Hyacinth is an outlier, I'm going to point out, because 12,000% increase is a little crazy. You can ask Shruti about that one. She's the one that made this, the data that was underlying all this. But we actually also lose pennywort. It's no longer detectable. It's not extinct. It's not that kind of zero, but it's not detectable by this airborne imagery. And then for the last piece, we see that Marsh, for the first time from 2014 to 2020, we see Marsh actually lost for the first time. And of this 12.8% of its habitat that it lost, 50% of that loss was attributed specifically to water primrose. Water primrose continued to grow during this. And interestingly, water hyacinth decreased. So that is hinting, or we have a, from Christiana A, she just graduated with her PhD from UC Merced. I believe she has unpublished research that um, suggests that water primrose is actually outcompeting water hyacinth. So that may be why we have this decrease. And I just wanted to remind that from our models from earlier that I showed that persistence is the uh, predictor that we were using that was most important during this era, which makes sense. This is a point where it's actually able to exist for a long time. Um, so overall, what the results are telling us is when you're thinking about choosing sites for restoration, you might want to consider the shape, the complexity of that marsh. So the more edge that you're having relative to that area, the more opportunity you might have to be invaded. So keep this in mind. Additionally, if you're looking at sites, whether it's one that you're already working on or looking into, I would not recommend picking a site where water promos has been persisting for a long time. It's going to be much harder to control once it's in there. 
And so, yeah, Michael Gross is up next talking about allelopathy. And if we have time for questions, I'm here. Yeah, I've got one from online. Ramona Swenson asked, for the purposes of designing aquatic shoal and intertidal marsh restoration, what water depth exceeds Primrose ability to establish and spread? And Aguirre, while we're at it. Aguirre, I don't know. I don't study that. Um, water Primrose, I don't know the exact number. I know that if you look at uh, Brenda Gruel, she has a report that came out with the uh, Army Corps engineers, and that number's in there. But it's, it's not deep. It's like a few meters at most. Yes, I would be able to tell you in like six months, <laughs> but I already know it exists in Brenda's paper. <laughs> yeah, there's another question over there. Hi, were you able to integrate the changes in uh, the permit requirements for their ability to for division boating waterways to apply their herbicides? That's changed over time. What target species they can use? I mean, only recently we were able to go after. Uh, primrose. So any any thoughts on that, on how you saw that pattern with hyacinth and primrose? About how primrose might be out-competing hyacinth? Yeah, it might be, uh, there might be uh, this, uh, basically they're filling in that niche after control on hyacinth <laughs> more more in the historical past. Yeah, Shruti and I were talking about this. So it could be it's out-competing or it could be that from spraying and killing off uh, hyacinth, it's opening up habitat again for water primrose to also spread out. So that could be the decrease we're also seeing. We need to pick it apart more. It's just an early trend we're starting to notice and we're seeing connections between a few of the other studies we've been working on. And so that would be like a next next step type thing to actually- a few years when they were allowed to spray water hyacinth, but not primrose. Mm -hmm. So that that those years are part of that second window. So. Definitely, some of that must have been done. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have Michael Gross from the U.S. Geological Survey on ribbon weed, which is a recently identified submerged aquatic weed in the Delta. All right, so some of the work I'm gonna be talking about today, I led or participated in, but I just wanna make it clear that the work I'm talking about today also covers work done by a variety of other folks at a variety of other organizations, and I'll uh, acknowledge them as I go. So in 2017, Trish Gilbert at the Division of Boeing and Waterways found an unknown plant at Long Island, which you can see here on the map in sort of the west central portion of the Delta. And in the following years, more patches were found largely by DBW, but also uh, other folks from other organizations who are active in the Delta. And so currently this plant has been found in a number of places around the Delta, ranging as far north as Old Town, Sacramento, and as far southwest as Sherman Lake in the confluence. So in July 2021, DBW submitted samples to CDFA's Plant Pest Diagnostic Center where Patrick Woods and Laney Fan use DNA sequencing to identify this species. And all the samples submitted by DVW came back as Ballicinaria australis, commonly known as ribbonweed. And they use DNA sequencing for this because the different species of Ballicinaria are difficult to differentiate morphologically. The species is native to Australia and has been previously introduced in a number of other places, including New Zealand, Japan, Hungary, Belgium, and Germany. But this is the first documented introduction of this species in the United States and North America more broadly. So a little bit more about ribbonweed. It's a submerged aquatic plant species that's rooted in sediment. Its most distinguishing feature is probably its narrow strap-like leaves, which can grow to 10 feet long, oftentimes with the leaf tips floating at the surface of the water. Those leaf tips are rounded. It's a perennial plant species that spreads by creeping stolons and rhizome fragments. And so far there have been no flowers or fruits observed in the Delta. So here it's probably reproducing only vegetatively. Importantly, wherever this plant species occurs around the world, it is very dense, creating these monocultures that outcompete other plant species, oftentimes including other non-native invasive aquatic plants. 
It tolerates not only fresh water, but also can grow in salinities up to 10 parts per thousand. And it tolerates very low light, so it can handle quite a bit of turbidity and can grow at depths up to 27 feet. So we don't know just where or when the species arrived in the Delta, but we have a few hints. In 2021, the UC Davis Sea Stars Lab found a large patch in Sherman Lake. And being remote sensing experts as they are, they thought maybe you can see this patch from space. So sure enough, you can see this giant patch in Sherman Lake going back as far as 2013 in Google Earth imagery. So here you can see it in February 2020, which is the most recent imagery from Google Earth that it appears in. Here it is highlighted in red. And yes, those other blobs you can see are also ribbon weed, and I'll talk more about those a bit later. So if we go back in time, you can see it here in March 2017, October 2015. It's a bit harder to see here, I think, because the tide's high, but you can see it in May 2014 still. And you can even still make it out as far back as January 2013. And so if you can see it from space in 2013, it's probably been in this area for at least a few years prior to that. And another area of the delta, which I'll talk a bit more about later, Elk Slough, uh, locals have noted that the species has been present probably since at least 2007. And it may be that in Elk Slough, this plant was uh, dumped as an aquarium because this is a popular aquarium plant species. Uh, and the Portland Road Bridge does go right over there. So in August 2021, I requested a pest rating from CDFA. So Robert Price evaluated the risk to the state of California from ribbon weed using published literature. So after running it through their pest rating system in October 2021, they proposed a rating of B, which is the second highest risk threat. And so as a consequence of his rating, this species may now be refused entry into the state of California if it's intercepted at the border, which may reduce the likelihood of it being spread to other parts of the state. Similarly, in November 2021, the Division of Boating and Waterways requested a risk assessment from DFW's Invasive Species Program. So Deidre Rosser evaluated the risk using published literature, and after running it through their risk assessment tool in September 2022, they determined that ribbon weed causes or likely causes harm to the economy, environment, or human health. And this is an important determination because it allows the Division of Boating and Waterways to pursue control of ribbon weed in the Delta. So just want to summarize some of the harms that those two evaluations found. Much of them are due to the high densities that this species tends to occur in. So it impedes water conveyance, both for water delivery and for flood control. It can hinder water recreation, including both swimming and boating. It can invade and degrade restored wetland restorations. It harbors non-native predatory fishes, such as largemouth bass. It can reduce dissolved oxygen levels in the water. And by slowing the flow of water with that high density, it can increase the amount of breeding habitat for disease vectoring mosquitoes. So during June, 2022 to February, 2023, I spearheaded an effort to evaluate UAVs, also known as drones, as a tool for monitoring ribbon weed. I worked with DWR's UAV team, in particular, JT Robinson, Anthony Elias Linares, and Brian Armstrong. And we were able to go out and image pretty much all the known patches of ribbon weed. And from that imagery, we're able to measure the area of all of those patches. So I just wanna show you a little bit more about what the patches look like based on that imagery. So I'll start with some of the high boat traffic areas because those are important. So here you can see it at the entrance to the Hogback Island boat launch ramp area. It's that kind of brownish green blob in the water. Here it is at Long Island, which is the place where it was first detected. And here it is at the Delta Marina Yacht Harbor and Rio Vista. So you can see in all of these places that the boats are routinely driving through this stuff, um, creating quite a bit of disturbance. And because the species can spread vegetatively, um, this may be creating the increased risk of spread elsewhere. Okay, so next I'll talk about Elk Slough, which I mentioned previously. If you can see it. So all of those reddish blobs you can see in Elk Slough are places where we detected that there's ribbon weed. It's a little bit hard because there's a lot of canopy cover. So this is probably a conservative estimate. So let's zoom in a little bit. And so you can see here's the, the Cortland Road Bridge, which is possibly where it was um, introduced into the Elk Slough. So again, you can see it's kind of densely covering uh, the two different sides of the, the slough. And it's particularly dense around the bridge. 
And in the process of doing the UA race surveys, we were able to um, search more broadly than just the known areas. And the process found several new patches north of the known ones. And we were even able to estimate what we think is likely the northernmost extent of this species in Elk Slough, denoted here with the star. And the other spot I wanna highlight is Sherman Lake, which I also mentioned previously. So there are eight large patches in Sherman Lake along the Western side. Let's zoom in a little bit on some of the more infested areas. So here you can see that the species in the shallower areas expands outward in these distinctive dense circular patterns. I envision it kind of like uh, bacteria spreading on a Petri dish. And this area includes the largest known patch in the Delta which is approximately 90 meters in diameter currently. And as with Elk Slough, we were able to detect an additional patch that was previously unknown in the process of doing the imagery, which is this one here, probably just an area that's so shallow, it's a little bit hard to see from a boat. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you the size of the infestations by region. So again, here's the map where all the species uh, locations are. And here is the area of ribbon weed by region organized north to south as it is in the map. And so what you can see here is that the size of the infestation varies quite a bit across the different areas of the Delta. From one end of the spectrum, you can see Old Town Sacramento has just 57 meters squared, roughly. Um, and here you can see in the photo, it's just kind of hugging the pylons of the dock uh, in the shadow of Joe's Crab Shack. And the other end of the spectrum uh, is Elk Slough and Sherman Lake, those two sites I was just talking about, each of which have over 12,000 meters squared currently of ribbon weed. And so if you add it all up, you get a grand total of 28,564 meters squared, or about 2.85 hectares. To put that in more relatable terms, that's about 5.4 football fields across the whole system that we know about. And because we just started collecting data on this species, we don't have a very good idea of the growth rate, but we do know a little bit based on that one really big patch in Sherman Lake that you can see from space. So currently it's at 5,900 meters squared in area. And so if you go back in time to the images uh, on Google Earth where you can make out the patch fairly well and do measurements, you can start to get a sense for how fast the patch is growing. And so just as a reference, um, since 2020, the patch has increased in size by about 53%. So where do we go from here? Uh, in 2022, John Matson at the USDA conducted a mesocosm study where he evaluated 10 different herbicides uh, for their efficacy for, for ribbon weed and found that two formulations of Aquathol K, which are formulations of endothol, were most effective, which are fortunately um, chemicals that are allowable to be used in the Delta, because many herbicides are not um, able to be used here because of all the restrictions. And so the Division of Boating and Waterways, now with permission to treat this species and with a potential tool to try, um, they're gonna conduct some trial studies with the liquid Aquathol K at several of the sites of ribbon weed that are known this year. And they're also going to try using bubble curtains around these areas of treatment in order to increase the contact time. That's important because in the flowing water system of the Delta, it can be difficult to maintain the appropriate contact time with the plant. And so to summarize, this is a species that tolerates a broad range of environmental conditions. The known patches already cover 2.85 hectares in dense monoculture system wide. There are multiple patches in high boat traffic areas, which increases the risk of spread to other areas. Um, based on evaluations of this species growing in other parts of the world, it's considered likely to cause economic or environmental harms here. And we have some control options worth testing and DBW is gonna try those out this year. And with that, I just wanna leave you with the information on who to contact in the event that you find some of it while you're out doing field work. Thank you. We have time for two, three questions. Um, just, do you know if it's still being sold in aquarium stores? So I think that CDFA has the ability to go into aquarium stores if they see it and remove it. The challenge is they don't have a lot of staff to do it and a lot of aquarium plants get mislabeled. And so it can be a little bit hard them to track everything down but yes it, it i think any balisonaria species i don't think they should be allowed to be sold because there's an american species which is native to the central and eastern part of the u.s but is not native to here 
I think that one is also not supposed to be sold here. So technically they're not supposed to, but you might still see it around. And the aquarium store owners are are communicating, are, are have been communicated with this fund or? Yeah, or that's not? a good question. I don't know how CDFA goes about that. Presumably they are in contact with the local suppliers at nurseries and aquarium stores and things. But yeah, I don't know exactly how that works. And I'm sorry, what last one you said fragments, but uh, it looks like the stolons were what were the vegetative reproductive unit. Um, can it be, can you regrow, can it take root from chopped up leaves? Fortunately, I don't think so. I think you have to have at least a chunk of rhizome. So, but you know, when the boat props go through, maybe if they're just shaving off the top, like it's like a lawn, it's probably not going to spread. But a lot of times I think the props are tugging up the plants and that's what's going to spread it around. So Nick, um, on Zoom, Trin is asking, are mechanical methods feasible? If not, why? Um, I think DBW has considered doing hand pulling um, as a way to control it, but that's labor intensive and it's difficult um, and probably only works for smaller patches. Mechanical, other types of things like chopping it has some of the issues we were just talking about, which is you might spread it around unless you're very carefully uh, kind of containing the stuff around where you're doing the controlling. Anybody else? Oh, there now it's on. What's a bubble curtain? Oh, I don't know that much about it, but the idea is I think they have um, these devices that they lay across the bottom and it shoots up a curtain of bubbles from the bottom and it kind of helps hold the water in. I think whales do this, right? Don't they like round up their, their um, zooplankton using bubble curtains? And so, yeah, I haven't seen them in action, but it's, it's a fairly new tool that they're trying out. All right. Well, if there are no more questions, I just want to remind everybody that um, tomorrow morning at 8.30 is session 11, which will be Sturgeon. And thanks to all of you for tuning in. Thanks to our speakers again for giving their great talks. And thanks to the IEP workshop organizers for uh, helping with all the different aspects of making this project and this program go. So thank you. <laughs>